guys and welcome back to my ASMR channel. For today's video, we are going to look at the House of Night. So yes, I went over. I don't even know what book number it is. Someone's just going to have to figure that one out for me. Six? Seven? I went over it and the strangest thing happened. I realised that I couldn't remember anything that happened in the last book. Eric comes back to give a progress report on absolutely nothing. Good one, dickhead. Dying and undying hadn't improved this kid any. He was still pudgy and pale with a frizzy ball of carrot-coloured, uncombed hair sticking up in odd places on his head. I'm Elliot, he said. Elliot is still being dunked on five books later because why not? Maybe don't jump into making emotional decisions based upon your burning loins. 100 pages and 25% later and we are finally at the present of which the plot is taking place. That is ridiculous. At this point, Harry Potter would already be at school getting up to no good. At this point, Frodo would maybe be leaving the Shire. I'm not sure. He does sit on having the ring for like 15 or so years. Also, it's really funny to me that the answer to every issue, every problem in this book is cast a circle. Failing exam, cast a circle. Boyfriend dumped you, cast a circle. Accidentally step on some Lego, cast a circle. What if there's nothing left in me worth loving, he asked in a voice so low that I if I hadn't been standing close to him, I wouldn't have heard him. I think you can still choose what you are, or at least what you are becoming. Stevie Ray chose her humanity over the monster. I think it's up to you. He just tried to assault a girl in front of her and she's like, ooh, ooh you can still be good though if you choose to be, ooh, ooh. I've repressed it. Like I repressed my first year of secondary school. So you're going to have to catch up and watch like the six other videos before watching this. But first, right, like, comment and subscribe. Oh God, I hope no one heard me say this. I hope no one hears me say the next bit. Half the people that watch this content are not subscribed to my channel. So um, fix that subscribe what are you just watching my content for free that's not how that yes actually that is how that works actually yes you are watching my content for free but cost you nothing to subscribe there we go pulled it back managed to pull me back and what else check out my podcast and my third channel where i was attempting to do kind of like advent calendar you know 25 uploads in december for christmas yada 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 i did all right and then things happened this week with the 50 shades of gray video so it kind of backtracked a little bit but like whatever i guess i mean i'm still going to try maybe not do things on weekends i don't know oh yes I'm in a hotel again. I'm in, a, I'm in a hotel again. This is just my life now. You know what I mean? You have to eat other things in order to get that. You know what I mean? Follow me on Instagram. Might just follow you back. And what else? Merchandise. I've got my Christmas merch. Back out. Ayclothing.tmail.com. So go cop yourself some Christmas merch. I've like reduced, really slashed those prices down as much as possible while still being able to get, I don't know, 50p. So let's get on with it. Just a quick message, this isn't a sponsor. These people, again, they don't know that I exist, but as it's Christmas, I thought that I would like to promote a charity that I feel quite strongly and passionate about. I've been donating to them for a series of months now, and that is sense.org.uk. It's a charity specifically working with deafblind children, helping communities and carers across the UK. If you have the means, I encourage you to do a little bit of a donation. It's Christmas. Help some children with sensory issues or disabilities feel more Christmassy. Thank you and back to the video. Chapter 1. Zoe. The night sky over Tulsa was a light with a magical crescent moon. Its brilliance made the ice that coated the city and a bit and the Benedictine Abbey, where we just had our showdown with a fallen immortal and rogue high priestess, shimmer so that everything around me seemed touched by our goddess. I looked at the moonlight bathed circle that stood in front of Mary's grotto, the place of power where not long ago spirit, blood, earth, humanity and night had been personified and then had joined to triumph over hatred and darkness. The carved image of Mary, surrounded by stone roses and nestled within a ledge high in the grotto, appeared to be a beacon for the silver light. I stared at the statue. Mary's expression was serene, her ice-covered cheeks glistened as if she wept in quiet joy. Nice try. Girl that says ginormous and poopy. Zoe and her friends defeated Kelowna. For now. Predictably, Heath puffed up like a cat-smacked toad. Zoe, I'm not a damn pussy. 
Eric, looking very tall and full grown, kick your butt vampire like, snorted sarcastically and then said, No, you're a damn human. Wait, that does make you a pussy. Wow, um, good zinger, Eric. I bet Heath's gonna need some burn heal for that one. Also, he's been a bit like racist, but to humans, speciesist, I don't know. Ignoring Aphrodite, Eric spoke up. Darius, you should probably get stuck inside. I'll coordinate the reconnoitering with Stevie Ray and make sure everything runs smoothly out here. His words seemed okay, but his tone was all, I'm the big guy in charge. And when he followed up with a condescending, I'll even let Heath help out. He really sounded like a pompous butt. Yes, this is the same narrator who was waxing poetic in the opening paragraph. Also, you'll let me help out, Heath snapped. Your mum will let me help out. Doesn't make any sense. I am, Heath and Eric said together. Oh, for crap's sake, Zoe, they're both idiots, Aphrodite said. Truer words never spoken. It's the sixth book. There we go. And Zoe still can't choose between Heath and Eric. You can't say she don't care about the environment, though. The way she recycles men. We love an eco-conscious queen. Greta Thunberg would be so proud. Stark started to chuckle, which turned to a cough, which changed again to a painful gasp. His eyes rolled back and, like a slinky, he collapsed. What does this mean? Slinkies don't collapse, they, they slink. DV Ray appears and Zoe feels a tiny bit uneasy for no reason, aka Nyx is telling her to. Was that understanding I saw flicker through her eyes or was it something else? Something darker. The suspense is killing me. I hope it'll last. Chapter two, Stevie Ray. Great, this idiot's perspective. All right, you two, listen up. I'm only gonna say this once, act right. Standing between the two guys, Stevie Ray put her hands on her hips and glared at Eric and Heath. Without taking her eyes from them, she yelled, Dallas. But it's in third person, which, did they do this before? I can't remember. I'll be damned if I have to rewatch my own content to find out. Don't care. My point though is, it's jarring and I don't like it. Besides her, Dallas laughed. And I'm thinking red vamp with an earth element affinity trumps blue drama vamp. That made Heath snort and laughed and predictably Eric started to blow up again, bow up again, bow up again. No, Stevie Ray said before the stupid boys started throwing punches. If y'all can't say anything nice, then just shut the heck up. It sounds like it should be in first person, but it isn't. It's annoying. Stevie Ray is making sure that no raven mockers are about. She watched the four guys to be sure they were really going where she'd sent them, and then Stevie Ray turned and, with a sigh, started on her own mission. Dang, talk about annoying. She loves Z more than white bread, but dealing with her BFF's boyfriends was making her feel like a toad in a tornado. Wee. Wee. She used to think Eric was the hottest guy in the world. After spending a couple days with him, she now thought he was a big old pain in the butt of a supersized ego. There is no good reason for this to be in third person when it sounds exactly like how her first person narrative voice would be, and I would die on this hill. Stevie Ray has a thing with a fledgling called Dallas. Dallas, yeah. Don't worry, we don't need to remember his name because it's not gonna last. She's gonna dump him for an ancient bird man, as you do. Why in the world was she so jumpy? It could be because you're keeping stuff from your BFF. Stevie Ray muttered, then clamped her lips shut. No one talks like this to themselves. But she was going to tell Z about the other stuff. She really was. There just hadn't been time. And Z had enough on her mind about more stress. And, and it was hard to talk about even to Zoe. Why is this like amateur hour all of the time? Why does she think like an eight year old? You idiot, you're honestly an idiot. Stevie Ray finds an injured raven mocker shot out from the sky by Darius in the previous book. The raven mocker says, kill me because everyone in this book is drowning in melodrama, 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 melodrama and angst. And then he laughs and it's so human. And that's enough for Stevie Ray to be like, well, Better save you then, despite us being on opposite sides and despite, I don't know, you trying to kill us. It's fine, I guess. Chapter three, Zoe. Well, one positive is that these chapters are flying by. One negative is my hair is a disgrace. Also, how do my under eyes look? Because they've been like really baggy and bad recently and it's a mixture of sleeping too much, nope, sleeping too little. Caffeine, not drinking enough water, perpetually dehydrated me. And I was told, I went for a skin consultation because my skin has been looking rank as well, right? Stress, hard water, that type of thing. And I was told the only thing that really helps with under eyes is just staying hydrated because it is genetic. You can't really do much about it. Sleep enough, eat healthy, stay hydrated. This lady was like, I drink four litres of water a day. And I was like, how do you have the time? What do you mean four litres of water a day? So I told her, oh, but I film under like, you know, these these studio lights. And she said, colour correct then. Get an orange, it'll help like neutralise. I was looking for an orange colour corrector. Don't exist. It does, but I couldn't find it in Superdrug. So I got an orange like Barry M 
lipstick i made sure that it wasn't going to like you know that it was like under eye friendly but i've put the orange on and then just put like a foundation on top and not bother with concealer so let me know how my under eyes look like because usually this one is this is the is this one the bad one yeah look at it i can see it there this is the bad one this is like the bruiser the money maker the one that always looks like i've been punched <laughs> anyway these chapters are flying by temper uetsi agea grandma redbird rebuked me gently we did it we finally learned uetsi agea so well that the text did not have to remind us that it's the cherokee word for daughter i know that si <laughs> that's not fair it's not fair not like this not like this great now I need to learn a whole new word. Thanks for nothing. This word, sitaga ashaya, sitaga ashaya, sitaga, sitaga ashaya, sitaga has. No, I can't. Sorry, but this word it means rooster. I don't know why she called Stark this. She was talking to Stark, maybe because he's a massive cock. Sorry, Grandma, I should watch my temper, but it's kind of hard when the people I love most keep almost dying. I feel like the cast duo just aren't even trying anymore. This just feels so corny. It's so like fan fiction-y. Maybe they've got someone else to write it, who knows? Zoe is being sharp with Stark. So a nun is like, um, he just tried to sacrifice himself for you, actually. The nun's harsh words gave me a jolt of guilty shock that closed my throat and didn't let me respond to the hard-eyed woman. The sacrifice Stark had been willing to make was was his life for mine. I swallowed past the dryness in my throat. What was my life worth? I was just a kid, barely 17. I'd messed up over and over again. I was the reincarnation of a girl created to trap a fallen angel, and that meant deep inside my soul I couldn't help loving him, even when I knew I shouldn't. Couldn't. No. I wasn't worth the sacrifice of Stark's life. So then we're like treated to this self-deprecating garbage, which Zoe doesn't believe anyway, because she thinks that she is hot shit, because she is the most special fledgling of all time. Sister Emily, I relieve you of in your infirmary duties for the rest of the night. Please send Sister Bianca here in your stead. I believe you should perhaps spend some time in quiet and contemplation of Luke 637, said Sister Mary Angela. As you wish, sister, the nun said and hurried from the room. Luke 6.37, what's that? I asked. Judge not, and ye shall not be con judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. So the nun, right, gets told to go study the Bible some more for daring to make Zoe consider someone other than herself. A crime of the century, clearly. Can we come in? There's someone who really needs to see Stark. Damien glanced over his shoulder and made a stay there motion behind him. The soft woof that came in response told me the someone was really a some dog. Wow, how did you figure that one out all by yourself? Mensa called. They want you to join. Don't let her come in. Stark grimaced in pain as he abruptly turned his head away so he couldn't see Damien or the doorway. Tell that Jack kid she's his now. What a piece of shit. They bring Duchess in anyway, and Stark and Dog are both happy. Stark asks Jack if he, they can share Duchess, because Jack, no, because Stark is too busy almost dying. Fair enough. Shifting my worry from Stark to Grandma, I looked back and forth between the two people I cared so much about. She's known Stark for like three days. How does that compare to how much she loves her grandma? His eyes met mine and the rest of the room faded away. I'm always going to keep your heart safe, even if mine has to stop beating for that to happen, he told me softly. Get you a man who love bombs you this hard after less than a week. Anyway, she leaves with her grandma who is all, how long have you known you were reincarnated from the dirt woman, Aya? I don't know, she's known for like 24 hours. That's how bad the book's pacing is. Chapter four, Zoe. Zoe admits that she has a hard on. <laughs> I didn't know where I was going there with then. Then with there, going there, going then with, shut up. <laughs> For Kelowna, since he broke out the ground, but Grandma says you choose love and that's it. Crisis over. Thanks, Grandma. Zoe leaves to find her friends. Stevie Ray has created a big tunnel in the dirt underground and everyone else finds it comforting, but Zoe thinks it's creepy because Zoe is always right. It's going to be a Chekhov's gun for something. I think it is. Zoe gets spooked by shadows and screams, but it's just Aphrodite with the twins. I hope the tunnel caves in over the twins' heads. Shawnee thawed first. You think? She wiped a shaking hand delicately across her forehead and turned to Erin. Twin, did she scare me white? 
Erin blinked at her BFF. I don't think that's possible, she squinted at Shawnee. But no, she didn't. You're still a gorgeous cappuccino. I followed them out into the root cellar where Damien was fanning himself and looking gayer than usual. <laughs> Sister Mary Angela approached the entrance. She touched the side of the newly hollowed out hole with reverence and said, Stevie Ray did this, but she did it with divine intervention. By divine intervention, are you talking about more of your The Virgin Mary is just another form of Nick's stuff? Stevie Ray's twang coming from the other side of the root cellar made us all jump. Yes, child, that is exactly what I mean. I don't want to offend you, but that's just about the weirdest thing I've ever heard, Stevie Ray said. Plenty of religions steal. No, take inspiration, sorry, from one another. Stevie Ray is just uncultured or an idiot doesn't read she's a lot of things i don't like her also how is that weirder than being marked a vampire dying coming back to life as the first ever red vampire and then and having no humanity and then having a another vampire sacrifice their humanity to save your humanity no sacrifice their vampirism to save your hope i don't know how i don't know how like aphrodite's so human that her humanity saved stevie ray from being a monster but then that got rid of her being a vampire doesn't make any sense. But like, that's weirder than someone thinking, maybe our God is the same, but just chooses different forms for... Idiots. Idiot. Stevie Ray is back from hiding the Raven Mocker and doesn't make herself seem suspicious at all. I'm so glad, Sister Mary Angela was saying, those creatures were such an abomination, mixing man and beast, she shivered. I am relieved we are rid of them. But it wasn't their fault, Stevie Ray said abruptly. Pardon me? The nun looked more than a little confused as he raised defensive tone. They didn't ask to be born like they were, all mixed up because of evil. They were really the victims. I don't feel sorry for them, I said, wondering why Stevie Ray sounded like she was standing up for the nasty raven mockers. Subtle. Just that I really don't think Nyx and the dang Virgin Mary have anything to do with each other. Jesus' mama definitely didn't help me move the earth to make this tunnel, she shrugged a shoulder. She is quite intolerant, Stevie Ray, for a supernatural being whose goddess is literally magical. Well, I've been given this some thought and I personally don't find it such an odd hypothesis, Damien said. You should remember this in your fledgling one, one handbook. Mary is illustrated as one of the many faces of Nyx. It's taken six books and I've realised that Damien is just a poor man's Hermione Granger. So, like every moronic blonde extra in a horror movie, I took one step into the darkness. Really, blonde jokes. In the current year of our Lord, Zoe walks into the tunnel, hyperventilates and faints. I'm not sure either. Chapter 5. Zoe. Zoe is senseless and trapped in the darkness. Nyx tells her to listen, and then Zoe relives being Aya, trapping Kelowna in the tunnel. His wings covered us, keeping the chill of his touch from burning me. His lips met mine. We explored each other slowly, thoroughly, with a sense of wonder and surrender. As our bodies began to move together, I knew complete joy. And then suddenly, I started to dissolve. I think she's having a wet dream. Aphrodite slapped Zoe awake, which, fair enough. Her friends thought she was rejecting the change, as if we'd be so lucky. Instead of telling her friends the truth, she lies and says she fainted because the tunnel was scary. They don't believe her, so she ends up telling the truth instead. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I burst out. The stress and honest to goddess confusion about what had just happened boiled over inside me. I don't have the damn answers. All I have is the memory and the zero time to process it. How about you guys back off just a little and let me get the mess inside my head straight? Do you know what's inspiring? Anyone can write like this. Anyone. It's so clumsy. Anyone could do this. You could all get a book deal. Do it. Don't let your memes be dreams. There's an explanation of how Stevie Ray made a tunnel in the dirt and it's truly as interesting as it sounds. <laughs> I too enjoy talking about dirt. I'll handle this, mate. <laughs> Oi, fish face. Loose up in. Hey, congealy. Got it. Come to negotiate, eh? Have you, you slimy git? Look what I got. I got a jar of dirt. I got a jar of dirt. What do you mean, Witchall? That doesn't make any sense, Z, she said. I brought all the red lit fledgling jar met before, plus Eric and Heath. Who else are you talking about? Her words sounded normal, but she ended with a weird nervous laugh and wouldn't meet my eyes. My stomach clenched. Stevie Ray was still lying to me. Could she be any more obvious? The rest of the fledglings are watching the sound of music for some reason. Hey, Earth to Zoe, check it out. The nuns have a massively big selection of Doritos and I even found some brown pop for you, full of caffeine and sugar, said Heath as he jumped down the last three steps into the basement. That's the end of the chapter. I don't know why that's the end of the chapter. Chapter six, Zoe. Did you find anything after I left? Stevie Ray's voice suddenly got so sharp that several of the red fledglings glanced over from watching Maria and the Von Trapp sing my favourite things. Seriously, 
why is she so so obvious you have to have negative iq points to not notice something weird about stevie ray dallas found raven mockers bodies outside so he hid them in the dumpster until they work out what to do with them because it's so cold outside the bodies will keep like a chicken in the fridge they can't stay in the dang dumpster stevie ray spoke over heath as if she hadn't even heard him it's not right why not i asked calmly I'd been quiet until then because I'd been studying Stevie Ray, watching closely as she became more and more upset. Stevie Ray suddenly didn't seem to have any problem meeting my gaze because it's not right, that's why, she repeated. I think this is quite the unrealistically quick turnaround of ethics. Like in a normal pace book, maybe it'll take a few weeks or so, but we just apparently don't have that type of time in these books. So Zoe thinks Stevie Ray is projecting her own feelings of insecurity about being a monster onto the Raven Mockers, hence why she's sympathizing with them. Zoe still hasn't discovered what empathy feels like, I guess. When I let her go, Thief surprised me by taking my hand. I gave him a question mark look. I'll walk you to Stark's room, he said. Feeling defeated, I shrugged, and he and I started down the hall, hand in hand. We didn't say anything, we just walked. Heath's hand was warm and familiar in mine, and I fell into step easily behind him. I was just starting to let myself relax when Heath cleared his throat. I think they're back together now? I don't know, I can't keep up. Wait, no, she's still dating Eric. God, make up your mind, woman. What do you want? What do you want? It's not that simple. What it's do you want? God damn it. What do you want? I have to go. So I hear that Stark swore himself into your service as a warrior. I studied him carefully, looking for signs that he was pissed or jealous, but all I saw in his blue eyes was curiosity. Yeah, he did. Word is, that's a majorly special bond. Word is, who would Heath, the human, have heard this from? Heath is all, do you love him? And she's like, sure, maybe. Why not? What's more? <laughs> I thought she actually did say that then. She's like, sure, maybe. Why not? What's one more guy in my harem? Heath didn't say anything. He just watched me with that sweet, sad, familiar look that said more about how badly I was hurting him than a dozen screaming matches between us would have. He was breaking my heart. I'm I, I'm hurting him and he looks sad, so he's breaking my heart. Hmm. Stop hurting him then. Duh. She has a spoon with him instead because that'll fix the boy drama. Because I love you, he said simply, I've loved you for as long as I can remember and I'm going to love you for the rest of my life. Tears stung my eyes and I blinked hard, trying not to cry. But Heath, Stark's not going to go away and I really don't know what I'm going to do about Eric. I know. This, plus her connection with Kelowna, Heath is either the biggest simp or he has the patience of a saint. Because, make no mistake, Heath wouldn't be able to have three girls on the side if he was with Zoe. She had probably killed them like those blokes a few books ago that she chucked underneath a truck. There is a massive double standard here. It's like a one-sided polyamory. There isn't anything to do about me. I'm with you. That's it, he paused and then added quickly, like he wanted to get the words out of his mouth. If I have to share you with the vampires, I will simp. I realised it was wrong of me. But instead of answering him and arguing that us being together just couldn't work, I curled up in his arms and let him hold me. Yeah, it was selfish of me, but I lost myself in Heath and the touch of my past. The way he held me was perfect. He didn't try to make out of me. He didn't grope me or grind against me. He didn't try to fill me up. He didn't even offer to cut himself and let me drink his blood, which would have us automatically let loose a passion between us that would burn both of us out of control. Heath held me gently and murmured how much he loved me. He told me everything really would be okay. I could feel his heart beat against me. I could sense the rich, enticing blood that was there, so warm and so close. But just then, what I needed even more than his imprinted blood was familiarity, our joined past and the strength of his, un of his understanding. So by, you know, like not groping her or grinding her, a man shows a woman the bare minimum of respect and we have to applaud that. Chapter seven. Feeling like a total butthead, Stevie Ray slammed the Abbey door. What? third person narrator talks like this she goes to find eric stevie ray narrowed her oh that i needed to say this on the main channel i forgot so it's not done yet but i'm hoping before chris i'm hoping before christmas that my um parodica work in progress title the prime minister and the pig will be out before christmas maybe by the time that i do the next video maybe not i just like and i need a favor from you guys for any of you that care to if you don't care to that's fine i won't take it personally i will no i won't i would love it it would mean the world to me if when i release this parodica for the price of 1.99 that i get onto the amazon bestsellers list which i've been reading different ways about it and i thought it was a minimum of like 5,000 sales in the first week because evangelina scoff told me that but i was googling it and i can't really find that same information so just making sure my microphone's not backwards. I've done that a few times. It's, I think it's more about how quickly 
you sell them rather than how many that's what one article said anyway so when the book is ready and live i will announce it on this channel and it would mean the world to me if you guys bought my porodica that i'm working on i've been working on it for months i haven't i started it in the summer and then i forgot it existed so but it should be a fun read it's very it's just satire it's just parody i was writing a scene the other night and i had this it was 3 a.m and i was having my 3 a.m thoughts of oh you're a bad person but i'm feeling guilty over like you know stuff that i did like 10 years ago and i was writing it and i kept it because you know at 3 a.m you're just more vulnerable and you should just go to bed because like you're tired your defenses are low i was writing this scene and i kept having this overwhelming feeling of i'm going too far i'm going too far i'm going to get sued by the former prime minister or if not that like someone's going to hit me for this and i'm not trying i'm actually not trying to be mean i'm just trying to be funny and ridiculous more than more than anything um but it's certainly a weird thing to do and i feel like it's going to alienate me from the professional job market for the rest of my life but hey why not short-term gains over <laughs> long-term losses so i'll let you guys know but i just want you to know that that's what i'm working on hoping to have it out before christmas consider it like christmas merchandise even though i have christmas, christmas merchandise but like you know one pound 99 christmas merchandise consider it like that if you don't care and don't want to read like some silly prodica fair enough <laughs> i don't think it's for everyone i don't know how many of you guys know but a few years ago i wrote my own erotica parodica piers morgan's vegan lover it's available on kindle via amazon it's 99p I'd really appreciate it if this Christmas, you know, I am doing my other one at the moment, but in case that doesn't come out in time, check this out, give it a purchase. It's about Piers Morgan and his vegan lover. So what's there not to love about it? It is only 99p because that's how much a sausage roll from Greg's used to be. So I would love it if you could purchase it and up my Amazon rating and go ahead and give me a rating on Goodreads. I just really want my silly little story to be an Amazon bestseller and almost entire four years after I first published it. I can't believe I did this four years ago and I didn't do anything since, but don't worry, I am working on something right now, but in case that doesn't come out, check out Piers Morgan's Vegan Lover, available on Kindle and Amazon for 99p. Anyway, she goes to find Eric. Stevie Ray narrowed her eyes at him. Yeah, I was calling you because you're supposed to be inside of everyone else. What the heck are you doing out here anyway? You're worrying Zoe like she needs any more stress from you right now. I think Zoe is absolutely fine right now considering she's spooning with Heath. If she was that worried, she could have come out here herself. I didn't say she was worried. Stevie Ray snapped, exasperated with Eric's self-absorption. But, but, but she literally did just say that. You're worrying Zoe. I didn't say she was worried. What? It's dawn soon, but Stevie Ray insists on doing stuff herself, like covering up the Ravenmocker blood to hide the Ravenmocker that she's, you know, kept alive. What they had done with the bodies of the Ravenmockers had bothered her because she didn't believe in life being devalued, any kind of life. It was a dangerous thing to think you were godlike and could decide who was worthy of life and who wasn't. Stevie Ray knew that better than the nun or Zoe ever could. Not only had her life, well, actually her death, been messed about with a high priestess who had begun believing she was actually a goddess, but Stevie Ray had once thought she had the right to snuff out lives according to her own needs or whims. Finally some growth and it only took her six books. Also, if she believes that, she better be vegetarian at the very least she goes to see the raven mocker and then literally nothing happens chapter eight stevie ray she tells the raven mocker she's not going to kill him and then makes this situ his situation all about her like everyone does in this book stevie ray bought supplies to bandage the raven mocker with and that's exactly what she does okay i don't have anything to clean you up with except water but i'll do my best oh and i bought some strips of moss if i pack your wounds with them they'll help she didn't bother to explain she didn't really know how she knew the moss was good for his wounds it was just one of those snatches of information she'd get from time to time out of nowhere one second she won't have a clue about something the next she'd be sure of how to well plug up a wound for instance she wanted to believe it was nix whispering to her like the goddess whispered to zoe but the truth was stevie ray didn't know nix works in mysterious ways mysterious plot convenient ways also i've been reading murtag is it murtag murtag because christopher paleny released a new aragon book which i had no idea he was doing that i've been reading that been enjoying it Aragon has its faults but you, like things can have their faults and I won't care like I can go along with stuff there was a show on Netflix called Bodies and not to give too many spoilers away but was the was the loop a paradox yeah yeah it, it kind of was but whatever I was enjoying it so I don't really care it's only when like 
<laughs> it's only when things don't make much sense and they're shit and they're just like indescribably popular that's when I like to make these types of videos. But yeah, I've been reading Murtagh and I've been enjoying it. Let me know if any of you have been, if you like the Aragon series, what you guys think. Stevie Ray ha helps him and he knows her as the red one due to Kelowna speaking of her. No offense, but from what I know of your daddy, I think it's best that you're here and he's not. He isn't exactly a nice guy. Not to mention Nefre has gone completely batshit crazy and the two of them are like peas in a nasty pod. You talk a lot, he said. Birdman, best character. His name is Rafame. Stevie Ray goes back to the others. We switch over to Rafame's narration. His wing is completely busted and won't work ever again. Rafame wants to die rather than be disabled and decides to go to Stevie Ray into killing him when she returns. Okay, that literally doesn't happen. Chapter 9, Zoe. Zoe decides she's going to make Heath go to college so he can have a life. That's what she thinks is going to happen. I raised a brow at Aphrodite. You and I are roomies. Darius is rooming with Damien and Jack. Uh, that means you're not sleeping with him because that would freak the nuns. You got that? Uh, no, you so didn't need to give me that Anne of Green Gables lecture. Like, I can't behave with some propriety. propriety. Are you remembering my parents purchased propriety for Tulsa? My dad is the mayor. I can't believe I have to deal with this shit. Darius and I stared speechless as Aphrodite worked herself up into a seriously extraordinary hissy fit. I don't know, I'm on her side. She's an adult. Later, lover, I'll miss you in my bed. She gave me a disgusted glance. Just say night-night to boyfriend number three and get your butt to our room. I do not like to be awakened after I've retired to my boudoir. Aphrodite tossed her long, gorgeous blonde hair and twitched away. She's really amazing, Darius said as he gazed lovingly after her. <laughs> Find you a guy who loves you as much as Darius loves Aphrodite. Darius admits that Stark is lacking in energy, spirit, blood, and he needs blood to heal his wounds better. I felt like a total idiot for not understanding sooner. He'd been hurt like I was and he had to have blood to heal just like I did. Well, why didn't you say anything before? Crap, I kept babbling as my mind raced. I don't especially want him to bite Aphrodite, but you can't pimp out Aphrodite's blood when she's not even around to say no. Luckily, Aphrodite's imprint of Stevie Ray prevents other vampires drinking from her anyway, but like that is not the point. He pledged himself as my warrior and gone through the change. I had hoped that the days of his biting other girls were behind him. Did you forget about the assaulting too? Or the nuns have some spare blood bags on ice for some reason. So Stark has had blood, but because he's a warrior who's pledged himself to a priestess, they have a special bond similar to an imprint. As your warrior serves you longer, you will understand more of your bond with him. Your link with your warrior means he could develop the ability to sense many of your emotions. For instance, if a high priestess is suddenly threatened, that the warrior pledged to her may feel her fear and follow that emotional trail to his priestess so that he may protect her from whatever is threatening. I... I didn't know that. I stuttered nervously. Sounds like she should have known more before getting into a lifelong commitment with a dude she barely knows. It would also break Heath's heart. And what if drinking from me let Stark into my mind and he saw what was going on in my memories of Aya? Hell, 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 hell. Then a new thought hit me. Hey, wait, you said Stark can bite Aphrodite because she's imprinted with someone else and other vamps don't want her blood. I'm imprinted with Heath. Does that mess up my blood for Stark? Darius shook his head. No, the imprint only changes a human's blood. That sure is convenient, almost as if it's being made up as they go along. Stark doesn't want to drink from Zoe though because he might weaken her. Where? Darius sighed and nodded his head slowly. Agreed, but he can be replaced. You cannot. Bro, she absolutely could be replaced. Nyx could decide to give a fledgling all of the affinities anytime she wants. Darius asks Zoe's permission to pledge himself as Aphrodite's warrior. You love her, don't you? He met my gaze steadily and his smile warmed. I do. She's seriously a pain in the butt. She's unique, he countered. What a positive PR spinner, Mr. PR. Zoe gives him permission. Chapter 10, Zoe. Wow, Darius was going to ask Aphrodite to accept his warrior's oath. Jeesh, a vampire warrior and a human prophet of the goddess? Huh, who knew? Zoinks. How are we almost a quarter of the way through and the only thing that's happened is Stevie Ray hides a bird? and Zoe checks on Stark. I remembered how terrible the burn had been and wondered if, even considering the possible ramifications, I should make a cut in my arm like Heath had done for me and then shove it against his mouth. He'd probably latch onto it automatically and, without thinking, drink where he needed to heal. But would he be pissed when he'd realised what I'd done? Probably. I knew Heath and Eric certainly would be. Yeah, it's probably not good optics to force the sexual act of blood drinking onto someone whilst they are unconscious, Zoe. Stark is awake and tells Zoe to stop stressing and that he was aware of the full implications of the warrior's oath. Stark, I have to tell you that kind of makes me feel spied on. Well, stop impulsively doing things you don't understand them. I look down at our joined hands. How much could I tell him? Could I really talk to him? 
I'm your warrior. You can trust me of your life. That means you can also trust me of your secrets. I met his eyes and he continued, smiling sweetly at me. We're oath bound. That's a stronger tie than what happens between an imprint or even between mates. I'll never betray you, Zoe. Ever. You can count on me. This sure is a lot to put on someone you've known for less than a week. Zoe tells him she thinks Stevie Ray is hiding red fledglings. Stark freaks out and then he just gets over it. Zoe wants to drink Stark's blood, but he refuses, so they have a cuddle in bed together until Stark falls asleep. Please can someone dump Eric already? Zoe goes upstairs to her room, but stops to admire her new tattoo and is caught by Eric. Chapter 11. Eric. Eric kisses her and immediately gives her shit about drinking blood from Heath. Which, you know, saved her life before, but okay. She tells him off and then he's all, let me see your new tattoo, like trying to be sexy about it. Bro, read the room and go to bed. Zoe rejects him, so he starts blowing up about Stark, Heath and Kelowna. Two things can be true. Zoe is a nasty little cheat who loves male validation. And Eric is an oversensitive, insecure, possessive, aggressive man. They're a match made in hell. Zoe dumps Eric. Finally. His face had gone utterly white. What the hell's happened to you? You used to be so sweet. Now you're a freak. Mary. Why do you keep jumping all the time? You fucking freak! <laughs> you're a freak! <laughs> and I'm sick of you cheating on me of everyone who has a dick. You should be your Stark and Heath and Kelowna. They're what you deserve. He stomped angrily past me, slamming the door to the stairwell. This is low-key funny because it's true. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. Aphrodite eavesdrops the breakup and tries to make Zoe feel better the only way she can by vaguely insulting her. Comfort is for sissies and unattractive people. She's my spirit animal. Zoe asks Aphrodite that if Eric was so clingy with her, why did she try to force a blowjob on him, though she doesn't frame it like as that. But without me saying anything, Aphrodite continued, you know I used to keep my visions from Nefray, don't you? I nodded, and humans died because of it. Yeah, you're right, they did, and Nefray didn't care. I could tell. I wish we got given one example of this happening rather than just being told it over and over because in the first book it was just this throwaway bit of gossip that got treated as fact and then it's used against Aphrodite like this whole time and we still have never been given one example of it happening or the humans that supposedly died. Also Zoe straight up murdered some blokes a few books ago so she's not one to talk. Somehow all of this has something to do with her blowing Eric. Her lips curled up and she shook her head laughing little. Goddess, you're such a prude. No, doing it with Eric was actually not bad at all. It makes me sick to remember how I kept quiet about my visions and basically shit on Nick's path. Nyx shits on her own path by never doing anything properly. Like her path is not everyone else's responsibility. Aphrodite tells Zoe that Stevie Ray is hiding things from her. They decide to go back to the house of night tomorrow. It's clearly not a safe space. So I don't know why they're so obsessed with it. Like they have four adult vampires with them. So they wouldn't start to reject the change, unfortunately. So I just don't see why they have to go back to the school. Chapter 12, Zoe. Zoe is sleeping and dreaming about being in the castle on an island and it's so beautiful, but Kelowna is there. You are obviously sleeping alone. Were you with someone else, it would be much more difficult for you to be touched by me. I suppressed the confused longing his voice made me feel and filed away that little bit of info. Sleep sleeping with someone else did make it more difficult for him to reach me, just as Stark had told me the night before. The sleeping in bed with Stark thing only happened the previous night. I don't think I've ever seen Pace in this bad. Also, why would Kelowna tell her that? But why? What's the benefit for like him telling her that? Truth, my mind reminded me. Use the strength of the truth to fight him. Mind is a funny new word for Nyx. I wanted to deny that I'd come to him, to say something smart and high priestess-like, but all I could do was stare at him. He was so beautiful. What a genius, saviour of the world. Zoe keeps being like, oh, he's sexy. No way, he's evil. No way, he's sexy. It's tiresome. He was so darn hot, I could hardly breathe. Then stop. We won't miss you. I blinked. I could tell the truth. Right now, what I really want is sleep. I want to be normal. I want to worry about school and paying my car insurance and how stupidly expensive gas is right now. Wow, hashtag relatable. Kelowna begs her to give him a chance because Zoe is that beautiful that a demigod is begging. You say I'm supposed to love only you, but you're not even free. You're with Nefere. Some of his easy confidence disappeared. Nefere is not your concern. His words made my heart squeeze and I realised that a big part of me had wanted him to deny that he was with her, to tell me that it was over. Disappointment lent me strength. You've already got two boyfriends. Stop it. Zoe tries to escape him, so he starts getting genocidal and threatens to kill the modern world. And then he grabs her boob and she gets horny. <laughs> If you do not join me, you'll be my enemy and I will burn you with the rest of the chafe. Wheat from the ch chaff? Chaff. As he'd been speaking, his gaze had moved from my face down to my breasts. Now he cupped both of them in his hands. 
that's lovely but isn't zoe like 17 and he's like immortal can you not zoe chucks herself off a cliff to wake up she can't even get a full night's sleep without having boy drama chapter 13 zoe she wakes up and aphrodite is screaming because she's had a vision and her eyes are filled with blood and she's blind she had a vision that nephrate is now calling herself nyx and that the world was on fire with vampires and humans burning to death so here's the end of the vision colonna was there and nephrate wasn't there instead you were there with him and i do mean you were with him he was all over you and you liked it uh may i just say ew about having to watch that makeout scene especially since i was watching it from the perspective of the people who were roasting while you did the nasty basically it was more than clear that you being with colonna caused the end of the world as we know it good one zoe thanks for nothing aphrodite also had a vision that people died but zoe killed colonna and stopped the fire aphrodite tells zoe that she's the only one who can kill colonna and to stop running away from him I bet she doesn't even kill him. I think he gets redeemed somehow just because he's hot. Chapter 14, Zoe. Stark interrupts them because he felt Zoe's fear and rushed to find her. Stark's jaw tightened. I should have known he'd try to get to you through your dreams. I know his tricks. I should have made sure you slept with Heath or Eric. Aphrodite snorted. That's a new one. Boyfriend number three wants you to sleep with boyfriend one or two. I'm not her boyfriend, pra Stark practically roared. I am a warrior. I've given my oath to protect her. That means more than some bullshit crush or stupid jealousy. Aphrodite just stared at him. For once, she didn't seem to know what to say. How has the sex offender become the mature one? Aphrodite leaves to stay with Darius so Stark can stay with Zoe to protect her dreams from Colonna. I am okay. A lot more okay than you'd be right now if you'd come rushing up here in the middle of a sunny morning. When I felt your fear, I had to come to you, even at the risk of my own life. That's part of the oath I swore to you. Well, that'll be inconvenient, you know, for Stark, if Zoe finds herself in danger on a warm, sunny day then. Zoe somehow knows that Colonna is on an island recharging, but Stark doesn't know what she's chatting about. Like, just chatting bare shit, mate. And she uses this knowledge to try to pressure Stark into drinking from her, despite him saying no a few times. They go to sleep. Chapter 15, Aphrodite. She noted with a vague sense of irritation that Damien and Jack and Duchess were curled up in one bed together. Sure, they reminded her of puppies, but it wasn't exactly fair that the penguins were cool with them sleeping together while at the same time they'd banished her to rooming with Zoe. Or at least they tried. Maybe the nuns thought they were best friends, you know, in an, oh, these two female skeletons were buried together because they were roommates kind of way. And they were roommates. God, they were roommates. You didn't think Stark was up to, well, stuff, Jack said delicately. He looked sleepy, with tussled hair and puffy eyes, and Aphrodite thought he was even more puppyish than usual, and really cute. Of course, she'd gouge out her eyes before she admitted that out loud. Why not just do first person? I don't get it. <sighs> She's busy, she enunciated clearly. Aphrodite really didn't like hurting Damien and his girl slash boyfriend's Jack's feelings. See, it's funny, because gay men are actually women, and women are something to look down upon. Darius takes Aphrodite away and knows that she had a vision. They go to Stark's vacated room to talk. They haven't had sex yet because they are, shock, getting to know each other. Getting to know one another first. What a concept. Oh no, I'll get it myself, no problem. Aphrodite boinged up like one of those freaky puppets with strings. Darius gives her a massage. Why is he the best man in the entire series? Then Aphrodite blurts out that she loves him and he loves her too. And then she gets upset because she doesn't want to end up like her parents' loveless slash abusive marriage. So he pledges himself to be her warrior. Bitch, the cast do I better not screw this up for Aphrodite. Why would you want to be sworn to me? I'm a total bitch, his smile returned. You are unique, Mr. PR, love him. She accepts the pledge. Chapter 16. Stevie Ray doesn't know what to do about Rafame, and surprisingly, she actually has the only interesting storyline going on right now. She decides to move him somewhere, presumably where the naughty red fledglings are being kept. She goes to the shed slash greenhouse to get Rafame and realises that it smells of evil. Chapter 17. <laughs> Stevie Ray. Rafame's words drifted to her out of the darkness. Without seeing the monster he was, his voice had a quality that made him sound hauntingly, heartbreakingly human. That was, after all, what had saved him the day before. His humanity had reached Stevie Ray and she hadn't been able to kill him. We know. I haven't screenshotted it, but like, trust me, they've told us that five times already. Why does this book think that we are so stupid that we can't retain information from a chapter ago? Stevie Ray wants to help Rafame get to the depot using the tunnels that she's created. Rafame didn't waste time or energy on words. He nodded, turned, flung the blanket off of him, and then, as Stevie Ray held onto his good arm, glad that though he was big and appeared strong and solid, he actually weighed less than she did. We've been told that he surprisingly light several times. I'm assuming it's because he has hollow bones like birds do. Stevie Ray tells him that the bad red fledglings are in the depot still. 
So predictable. They shake hands and Rafaim says he's indebted to her and she says he could change if he wants. Merry meet, marry part and merry meet again, Rafaim. Is it meant to say marry or merry? <laughs> he leaves and she collapses the tunnel so she, he can't be followed by anyone. She's caught by Dallas, but he thinks that she's just protecting the Abbey from the red fledglings. Don't be gross, but she couldn't help grinning at him. Dallas really was adorable. Not only was he her unofficial boyfriend, but he was also a genius with anything to do with electricity or plumbing or basically whatever you'd find at Home Depot. This is important because I think in the next book, he basically becomes like the electric man from the game Infamous. She'd put Rafaim out of her mind. She'd help someone who had been hurt, that's all. And now she was done with him. Seriously, he was just one badly injured raven mocker. How much trouble could he cause? This is so Disney Channel coded. Someone please ban me from TikTok. I'm too old to know slang like that. Chapter 18, Zoe. Zoe is sleeping and then feels someone kissing her neck because of course, look, cast duo. Can you see how uncompelling Zoe's chapters are compared to Stevie Ray's? Zoe's problems are just boy problems. Stevie Ray and Rafaim turn into a boy problems problem, but at least it's more interesting than this. It's Kelowna spooning her because Stark got up for all of five minutes. Honestly, bro. For an immortal, he needs to get a life. He's obviously been psychically spying on both of them to wait for Stark to need the toilet so then he can strike and spoon. It's just bizarre behaviour. Like, get a life. <laughs> Should I have told Stark that Kelowna had still stuck into my dreams, even with him being so close and so focused on protecting me? Probably. Maybe telling him would have made a difference in what happened later. Self-inflicted. Over my shoulder, I said, hey, would you do me a favour while I'm taking a shower? Sure. He shot me a cocky grin, which telegraphed how good he was really feeling. Want me to wash your back? Uh, no, but thanks, I think. Jeesh, guys had such one-track minds. You're constantly thinking about whether you want to shag, marry, kill. Teeth, Stark or Kelowna. Be quiet. I'd relax in his arms. I hadn't been reliving one of Aya's memories or even under her influence, but I'd let myself go when he touched me and the result had been as terrifying as it was revealing. It had felt right to be of him, so right that I'd mistaken him for my oath-bound warrior and it hadn't seemed like a dream. I mean, mistaken him. I mean, like, you've barely known Stark for a few days, so you're forgiven for maybe mistaking him for someone else. And it hadn't seemed like a dream. I'd been too awake, too close to full consciousness. Kelowna's last visit had shaken me to my core. No matter how hard I tried to fight, fight against it, my soul recognises him, I whispered to myself. And then, as if my eyes were jealous of the water already running down my face, I began to cry. Honestly, just keep it in your pants or your problems will be solved. Zoe gathers the nuns and fledglings together. I turned to see Aphrodite and Darius standing behind me. They were holding hands and looking very glowy and, as the twins would say, happy smappy. The twins have a single brain cell between them. And suddenly I was feeling very guy claustrophobic. I mean, a buffet of boys sounds like a good idea in theory, but I was quickly finding out that, much like straight leg designer jeans, it's only in theory that the idea is good. As if to reinforce my thoughts, Eric chose that instant to join us. Venus, the red fledging who was Aphrodite's old roommate, was practically velcroed to his side. Ugh. Just ugh. This is the same problem every single book. Also, like, you can't complain about Eric finding- see? See the double standards? Eric finding Venus so quickly while she has like a rotation of three different men on the go. But he's the bad guy because he found Venus so quickly. He's a bad guy for other things, but not for that. Like, this is what I mean. If Stark, God forbid, got a girlfriend, she would not be okay with that. Hi everyone, man, I'm starving, Eric said. He blazed that big warming movie star smile that I used to heart so much. <laughs> Through my peripheral vision, I could see Heath and Stark gawking at Eric and his Venus leech, who was definitely suckerfish to his side. See, you dumped him, right? And you have three other guys on the go, including the demigod, leave Venus alone. Eric's smile faltered just for an instant, but his acting skills were way up to the task of making it look, look as though he'd moved on like 15 seconds after we'd broken up. Hi Zoe, didn't see you over there. As usual, you're surrounded by guys. Damn, it was always crowded with you, with a sarcastic chuckle. <laughs> he pushed past me, bumping Stark with his shoulder. I mean, where is the lie? Eric made a possessive little motion with his hand and Venus practically trotted up to him. Embarrassing for her, but whatever floats her boat. Slipping her arm through his, she mashed her boob against his elbow, and then the whispers started like someone had lit them with a match. Eric and Zoe broke up. Eric's with Venus. Zoe and Eric aren't together anymore. Well, hell. Get a life. Why would they do that? Chapter 19, Zoe. I never liked him either. Stark took my hand and kissed it. Then he looked Heath in the eye. I don't like it much that you and Zoe are imprinted, but I don't have a problem with you. I'm cool with you too, dude, Heath said, but I don't like it much that you slept with Zoe. Hey, just part of the job description of being her warrior, keeping her safe and all. Are we finally letting Zoe be polyamorous without everyone being and her keeping secrets? 
In a sec, I turned to Sister Mary Angela. How's grandma this morning? Worn out. I'm afraid she did entirely too much yesterday. Is she okay? She will be. Maybe I should go to her and... I started to walk away from the dining room, but Aphrodite caught my wrist. Grandma's going to be fine. Right now, I can promise you, she'd rather have you figure out what we're doing next than stress about her. Aphrodite should be the main character yet again. Hey, I said quickly under my breath to her. I dumped Eric and he's hooked up with Venus in front of everyone. Eric is awful, yes, but you have two, potentially three boyfriends. Get over it. They go in to meet the others. Hey Z, you're finally up. Check out the seriously yummy pancakes the nuns cooked for us. Jack bubbled at me. Oh Jack, you eternal five-year-old you. Can't wait for the next book. I was rolling my eyes at both of them when Eric's voice drifted across the room to me. Really? Really crowded over there? His back was turned to us, but that didn't stop his voice from projecting obnoxiously. How embarrassing for Venus that he's using her to get back at Zoe. No one in this book has any self-respect. Yeah, that's what Aphrodite sold us, but now he's with Venus, just like that? Jack repeated, staring at Eric and the aforementioned Venus, who was spider monkeying all over him so much that I was shocked he could actually eat. You dry humped Heath in public and then killed two guys for making fun of it. Zoe tells everyone about the vision, though omits some parts of it that make her look bad, aka her shagging Kelowna whilst in a field of burning vampires. But Cromisha has written a poem. I love these so much, can't you tell? I want to take the poem and, with the help of my friends, Figure it out. The power of friendship compels you. Stevie Ray tells them about the bad fledglings. No one's mad about it though. And they all decide to return to the house of night. Chapter 20, Zoe. Aphrodite clearly suspects Stevie Ray isn't being truthful. Stevie Ray tells everyone about Darius's warrior oath. What? Stark said. You gave Aphrodite your oath? Really? Damien said. Wow, too cool, Jack said. Eric snorted from the table behind us. I'm shocked Zoe let you and didn't just add you to her private collection. <laughs> it's funny. What? Stevie Ray said innocently. You didn't want everyone to know about you and Darius? My business is my business, Aphrodite said. Again, Stevie Ray is a terrible person with no respect for Aphrodite's autonomy. Just like I was saying before, Cromisha nodded sagely. It just ain't right to put your personal business all out in public. She turned her dark eyes on Stevie Ray. I know you are a high priestess and all, so I don't mean no disrespect, but I think you was raised better than that. Stevie Ray looked instantly contrite. You're right, Cromisha. I guess I didn't think it was that big of a deal. I mean, everyone would know sooner or later. She smiled at me and shrugged her shoulders. Isn't deflecting, dismissing and devaluing something that narcissistic people do? Though Stevie Ray's character always has plausible deniability for her actions because she acts like an idiot most of the time, but she clearly does know what she's doing. She's awful. She's manipulative. She's a coward who can't even stand by her own convictions. She's a slimy snake. I can't stand her. And yet she has the best storyline out of all of them at the moment. A warrior's oath isn't exactly something you can hide. She turned to Aphrodite. Sorry, I wasn't trying to be mean. I'm not interested in your apology. I'm not Zoe. I'm not going to automatically believe everything you say. As she shouldn't. Okay, enough, I shouted. Anger and frustration added power to my words. I saw several p kids flinch. All of you need to listen up and get something straight. We can't fight big world-ending evil if we're bickering with each other. Stevie Ray and Aphrodite, get over the fact you're imprinted and learn to not embarrass each other. It's always Stevie Ray stealing thoughts from Aphrodite and airing them out. All Aphrodite does is quietly, like, to take Zoe aside to tell her that she thinks Stevie Ray is hiding things from all of them. But Stevie Ray is the one who reads Aphrodite's mind and then just blurts out for everyone to hear to embarrass her. Justice for Aphrodite. Zoe tells everyone to get a grip and goes to see her grandma before they leave. So, you went to see Agea. You made everyone angry? Grandma said after listening to me rant while I paced back and forth beside her bed. Well, not everyone. I hurt some people's feelings instead of making them mad. Grandma studied me for a long time. When she finally spoke, her words were typically simple but straight to the point. That is unlike you, so you must have had a good reason for acting so out of character. That sure is some coddling. But how do I know that's all it means? What if I'm a shallow hoe and Stevie Ray's gone evil? Why would you say that to your nan? Why would you call yourself a hoe? Only time will show whether your trust in Stevie Ray has been misplaced. And I think you should stop being so hard on yourself for being attractive to more than one boy. You're making good judgments about the relationships in your life. From what you've said, Eric's behaviour was controlling and boorish. There are many young women who would have ignored all of that because he's, how would you put it, so hot? Grandma did a bad teenage impression. You'll learn to balance Heath and Stark, as many high priestesses do. Or you won't, and you'll decide committing yourself to one man is the right path for you. But darling, that is something you have many, many years to decide. This is the world's most, like, understanding grandma. No, once my... I don't know if I should say this. Once my grandma was... She was yapping. She was yapping and yapping about something. And she said that, you know, back in her day, they didn't have the pill and they didn't have all of this. But having sex with a condom was, like wearing socks to bed 
<laughs> she tells Zoe tells grandma about the Kelowna stuff and grandma solves it instantly by reminding her that she has free will no matter what her past life did though how a woman made from dirt had a soul in the first place is confusing but who cares don't think about it too much chapter 21 Zoe they travel back to the school and no one is speaking to her I didn't know what to say to that so we rode on in silence for a while until Stark cleared his throat and said you're pretty hard on everyone back there I had to shut up the bickering and that seemed like the quickest way Next time you could try saying something like, guys, shut up your bickering. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but that makes more sense than freaking out on your friends. I stifled the urge to snap back and say I'd like to see him do any better. Instead, I thought about what he'd said. He might be right. I didn't feel comfortable with the fact that I snapped at everyone, especially since a bunch of the ed- everyone's were my friends. Is this maturity in my house of night? Unacceptable. Imagine the cast duo were genius writers and Zoe was meant to be foul and judgmental in the previous books because she's slowly growing up. A book that actually does that concept well is The Thin Executioner by Darren Shan. So read that, not this. When my throat cleared enough for me to speak, I said, being my warrior might not always be an easy job. He laughed full and loud and long. He also slid his arms around my waist and said, Zoe, sometimes being your warrior will suck royally. I was going to mention that just perhaps his mum sucked royally. That is actually funny for Zoe as well. I don't know what's going on in this chapter. I hope it stops. So I grumbled something about him being full of bull poopy. Sure, considers making a comment about his mum giving blowies, but saying bullshit is a step too far. You read? I read, he said. Huh, I said, feeling befuddled. What's wrong with that? Reading's good, he said defensively. I know, it's cool you read. Actually, it's hot that you read. And it was. I loved it when cute guys showed they had brains. I would love it if you showed having a brain some time. They get back to the school and notice some weird lights. Professor Lenobia appears and tells them it's a funeral pyre for Anastasia Langford, who Rafame murdered. Chapter 22. Zoe. Everyone is shocked. Zoe is informed lots are wounded and need help. A terrible noise, like a heartbroken child's cry, pierced the night, and my gaze, which had been fixed on the grisly pyre, shifted to a place near the head of the bench. Dragon Langford was there on his knees. His head was bowed and his long hair swept forward, though it didn't hide the fact that he was weeping. Besides him, a huge cat I recognised as Shadowfax, his main coon, leaned into him, staring up into his face. His arm, In his arms was a delicate white cat who was yowling and struggling to get free, apparently willing to hurl herself onto the pyre with her vampire. Not to be that person, but why is he so upset when the afterlife 100% canonically exists? It really takes the stakes out of things, doesn't it? They use their elements to cheer Dragon up. How will ever be bearable, priestess? His voice was rough. He sounded completely broken. Bro is almost 200 years old. What on earth are you asking a 17-year-old for? I felt an instant of panic. An instant of, I'm 17. I can't possibly help him. Then, like a perfect circle, spirit spiralled from dragon through me and into the fencing master again. And I pulled strength from my element. You'll see her again. She's with Nyx now. She'll either wait for you in the goddess's meadows or she'll be reborn and her soul will find you again in this lifetime. You can bear it because you know that spirit never really ends we never really end. I told you, stop crying. Zoe notices that no one else is here and that's because almost everyone else is still brainwashed. Everyone except Zoe's core circle stay behind while Zoe goes into the school properly. Chapter 23. Zoe. They go to the infirmary to help all the injured fledglings. Nefre's assistants cause a fuss over it before storming off. Dino, Aphrodite's ex-friend, informs them that all of the fledglings injured got injured because they stood up to the raven mockers. Hannah Honeyager, I didn't see you over there, Damien said, no- moving around me to go to the girl's side. I could understand why he hadn't noticed her before she said something. She was covered by a big white comforter, which, dis- which she disappeared against because she was seriously the whitest kid I think I've ever seen. You know, one of those blondes who has skin so fair it never tanned as she always looked pink cheeked or either embarrassed or surprised. I only knew her through Damien. I'd heard him talking to her about flowers. Apparently the girl was a genius with anything that bloomed. I remembered that about her and the fact that everyone always called her by her first and last names, kind of like Shannon Compton, only they didn't run the two together. What is bro yapping about? What are you talking? Shut up. I was watching Shawnee as she stood outside TJ's room, looking like she didn't really know what to do with herself, which gave me a really bad feeling. Cole and TJ had been best friends and they'd been dating the twins. TJ was seeing Erin, Cole was seeing Shawnee. The two couples had done a lot of hanging out together. All I could think was, how could one stand up to the raven mockers and not the other? Because people are complicated and not identical. Did none of the professors stand with you? Darius asked, his voice sounding harsh, though it was obvious his anger wasn't directed at Red. The professors knew the raven mockers had simply become overexcited because Nefra and her consort were highly upset. We knew better than to further agitate them, said Sapphire, this is one of the nurses, in a clipped voice from where she and margarita still stood to the in-, in the entrance to the infirmary hallway oh look some brand new adults to easily hate because they have cartoonish levels of villainry zoe threatens them with spirit and they run away so everyone claps and no i'm not joking 
I've wanted to tell those cows off since we got here, called Dano from her room and she boomed a smile at me. And they call her terrible, Aphrodite said, obviously referring to the fact that Dino in Greek means terrible. If it's so obvious, why are you telling me? Shouldn't the name speak for itself? Dino says sorry to Aphrodite for ignoring her for months. Finally, someone is being nice to Aphrodite. They cast a circle, because of course they do, and they help soothe the kids. Chapter 24. Good idea, Z, said Stevie Ray, who was sitting on the floor next to Drew. I remembered then she'd kind of had a thing for the kid before he died and undied, and I acknowledged to myself that seeing her flirting with him, when I thought she probably had a thing for that red fledgling kid named Dallas, gave me a moment of selfish glee. It might be borderline mean of me, but it would sure be nice if my BFF and I could talk about how to juggle multiple guy problems. Zoe should join Maiden in Chelsea. She would fit right in. They sort out the fledglings, figure out sleeping arrangements for the red fledglings, and work out that the injured fledglings are behaving normally because they rejected Kelowna, which, you know, no shit, Sherlock. Sure, Kremisha is so organised she's almost OCD. Cancelled. Good, put her on it, I turned to Darius. The bodies of the raven mockers have to be gotten rid of now. If we're lucky, the storm is finally clearing, which means humans are going to stir, to stir as soon as it's light. They can't find those creatures. Why not? Am I being daft here, or has it not been explained why they want to hide the raven mockers from humans? They clearly aren't immortal, the raven mockers, or immune to being shot. So what's so bad about the humans being aware that something supernatural is on and that they can defend themselves if they wish? There's minor foreshadowing about the twins not being as close anymore, but I care more about how Saddam Hussein managed to hide underground than the brainless twins splitting up. Not kidding. How did he manage to do that in that little hole? That picture, the, the the cartoon picture of like the artist's impression of, of him in the hole underground lives rent free in my head. Okay, we really need Lenobio of us. I looked over to where the horse mistress stood beside Dragon, but I don't know how to pull her away from him. Just tell him, Damien said. I gave him my question mark look. Dragon understands how dangerous Kelowna and Nefrey are. He'll understand that we need Lenobia. Damien's gaze went over to the vampire who's still on his knees. He's going to stay there and grieve until he feels right leaving. We can't change that or hire him up, so just tell him we need Lenobia. You're a smart kid, you know it? I said, affirmative, he said with a smile. He's not smart, you're all just a bright bunch of thickos, so bro looks like Einstein in comparison. Z, I'm going to tell Jack to help Kremisha, Damien said. But wait, hold on, that's why Jack and Duchess get on so well? Jack is the golden retriever of the group? I'll wait with Dragon. Kremisha doesn't really need me. She's already has enough fledglings to boss around, Jack said. He and Damien had joined us. Duchess stopped several feet away and was lying on the grass with her nose on her paws. The cats paid no attention to her. I'd like to stay with you, that is, if you don't mind, he finished, speaking to Dragon nervously. Thank you, Drag, Dragon said, with his voice catching on a sob. Jack nodded, wiped his eyes, and, without saying anything else, sat next to Dragon and began gently petting Shadowfax. Well done, you, I said softly to Jack. I'm proud of you, Damien whispered to Jack and kissed him gently on the cheek, for wh which made Jack smile through his tears. For what? Showing the bare minimum of empathy? <laughs> Stark tells Zoe to go to the cafeteria and he'll meet her there. She thinks he's either going to cook or grab some bags of blood, but instead he sends Heath along because that is all Heath is good for. Chapter 25. Rafaim is sleeping in Stevie Ray's bed back in the depot, which is a bold move. He'd stopped at the kitchen and forced himself to eat and drink. The fledglings had left behind refrigerators filled with food. Refrigerators? That was one of the many miracles of the modern age he'd been observing for the long years he was only spirit. Bro is technically hundreds of years old and he fancies a teenager. Can any bloke in this book be normal? No. Rafaim gets disgusted with himself for being in her bed because he has a bit of sense. Don't worry though, that gets snammed out eventually. He goes to the kitchen but gets ambushed by the evil fledglings. The leader, Nicole, has Neferet in her eyes, quotation marks, leading Rafaim to draw the conclusion that Neferet now has an ability to project herself onto others. I escaped into the tunnels after being wounded by a warrior from the House of Night, he said truthfully. Rafaim's instincts, which had served him well for centuries, told him to remain silent about Stevie Ray, that even though these must be the rogue red fledglings she had been protecting, they were not truly of her flock, nor did they follow her. Instinct or Nick's meddling? These fledglings see Neferet as their queen, even though she's abandoned them, like how Kelowna has abandoned Rafaim. Nicole reads his mind to discover the truth that Stevie Ray saved him. Nicole wants to kill Stevie Ray, so Rafaim appears to agree. I wish he actually would though. Chapter 26, Zoe. Heath, what are you doing here? Heath clutched his chest like she'd shot him. Why is that in third person? I didn't notice that before. And staggered around, making mock gasping sounds. Your coldness is killing me, baby. His shoulders sagged and he shook his head. Why won't you let me help you in the one real way I can? I drew a deep breath and told him the complete truth, because I can't deal with the sex part of it right now. He blinked in surprise at me. Is that the only reason? Sex is kind of a big reason, I said. Yeah, well, not that I'd know from experience, but still, I get what you're saying. I felt my cheeks get warm. 
He was still a virgin. I thought for sure after I was marked and left my human life for the house of night, my ex-BFF had totally gone after him. Actually, I knew skanky Kayla had gone after him. Zoe was gone for all of a day before he came to the school and got imprinted with her. Does she really believe in less than 24 hours of being a heart, Keith immediately jumped on her ex-best mate. Heath, changing the subject won't change my mind. I'm not having sex, so I'm not drinking from you. Geesh, Zoe, I'm not a moron. I get that, he said. So we don't have sex. We spent a whole lot of years not having sex. We're experienced at it. I don't know why, but that was funny to me. Yeah, and the stuff is all about pleasure and sex, I said. Okay, so instead of us focusing on the sex part, we'll focus on the pleasure part. I raised my brows at him. You're a guy, Heath. Since when do you not focus on the sex part? This misandry is rich, considering all Zoe thinks about is how hot boys are and kissing them and wanting to do stuff with them. I went into his arms, inhaling his scent. Heath, blood, desire, home, and my past all wrapped up together in a strong, familiar embrace. When my tongue touched the line of scarlet, I felt him shiver and knew he was suppressing a moan of pure desire. I hesitated, but it was too late. His blood exploded in my mouth. Unable to stop myself, I pressed my lips against his skin and drank. And at that moment, I didn't care that I wasn't ready for sex or that the world around me was one big ball of chaos, or even that we were in the middle of the cafeteria while Stark guarded the door and probably was experiencing everything I was feeling. All that moment I cared about was Heath and his blood and his body and his touch. Does this mean Stark is outside popping a boner because of their psychic connection, technically getting erect over Heath and his blood? What a bisexual king. They both managed to get over the raw sexual chemistry part of the blood drinking, so that's something. Stark breaks them up after a while. I'm going to pretend really hard that you're not all giggly and I didn't just feel everything you felt in there, Stark said in a strained voice. Even through my blood rush, I understood that it must have been really hard on Stark to experience the intense pleasure another guy had just brought me. I have little sympathy for Stark here. He actually knew what he was signing up for when he became her warrior and she didn't. So he, like Eric, would have known that most high priestesses are polyamorous, but he, unlike Eric, said he would deal with it. Forced drama. Chapter 27. Zoe. They're back in the dorms and all the other fledglings are acting like zombies. Becca bumps into her. Yeah, I know what you're doing, what you're always doing. You were checking out a guy. I frowned. I didn't know Becca very well, except that she'd had a big crush on Eric. Oh, and I'd caught Stark biting and practically assaulting her before he'd chosen good and sworn himself as my warrior. Of course, Becca hadn't remembered the assaulting part. She only remembered the biting pleasure part, again, thanks to the jerk Stark used to be. So firstly, it's funny that the first bit is true. She's always checking out guys. But secondly, why is Zoe being so flippant about assault? Still, that didn't give her the permission to pop this ridiculous attitude on me, but I didn't have time to get things right with her, and honestly, I didn't really care that she was a big festering pile of I'm jealous of Zoe. She's a brainwashed zombie and a victim of sexual assault. Could you show a bit of empathy? Despite her clearly being brainwashed, Zoe still wastes her time trying to argue. I don't understand. Just get your drink and leave. There's no point. She turned her head, tossed her hair and gave him a flirty smile. Hey there, Stark. Eric's free me, he said bluntly. She blinked and looked a little confused. He and Zoe broke up, he added. Oh, really? She tried to sound nonchalant, but her vo body language gave away her pleasure. She glanced back at me. It's about time he dumped you. Other way round, you... you... bitch, I blurted. I don't really think that Stark should be talking to her, but okay. They go upstairs and meet everyone else. Really, Stark said. I almost had to pull that Becca girl off of Zoe. I could see by the looks on Aphrodite and Damien's faces that they were remembering Stark's not-so-nice past. Neither of them said anything. Maybe they should remember it. It is a pretty big deal. Zoe works out that everyone who is rejecting Kelowna are just making the right choice. That's it. No one said anything for several seconds and then Damien picked up the thread of my thought. Just like in life, Nyx gave us all choices. I grinned at him. And some of us choose wisely. Some of us mess up, Stark said. So with that in mind, are you telling me Stark could have not gone around assaulting girls, but instead he was choosing to? Because that sure is a can of worms, ain't it? I wouldn't call deliberately assaulting someone simply a mess up now, would you? That's my whole point with Aya. I have the choice not to follow her path, but wouldn't that mean Kelowna also has free choice and can choose good over evil? Zoe sure is trying hard to redeem a serial assaulter. Like, maybe not everyone gets a redemption arc, you know? They read Kromisha's poem and it's basically a love letter to Zoe, not from Kromisha, from Kelowna. Chapter 28, Zoe. The truth is that I'm connected to Kelowna. I remember the connection and remember it makes Kelowna hard to deal with for me. 
but something inside me defeated him once. I think I have to find that something and make the choice to defeat him all over again. This time maybe for good, Stevie Ray said. I seriously hope so, I said. Well, this time you won't be alone, Stark said. That's right, said Damien. Absolutely, Shawnee said. Yep, Aaron added. Wow, it's like the Avengers. All for one and one for Zoe, Stevie Ray said. I hope Rafame eats Stevie Ray and not in that way. I know where Kelowna is, Jack said matter-of-factly. What do you mean you know where Kelowna is, Damien said while we all gawked at Jack. Well, him and Nefret, that is. Easy, he held up his iPhone. Internet's back up, and my vamp Twitter has been going crazy. It's all over the net about Shakina dying all sudden mysterious, and Nefret showing up in Venice at the High Council, saying she's Nyx incarnate and Kelowna's Erebus come to Earth, so she should be the next vampire high priestess. We stared at him. I know my mouth was definitely flopped open. Jack frowned at us. I'm not making it up. Promise. You can see it all right here. Why would the Venice part be on Twitter unless this means that the high priestesses all have Twitter fingers and are gossiping online? Imagine a vampire du moi. People anonymously being like, this A-lister high priestess has caused a stir, rocking up in Venice with her new hot man, claiming she's the goddess incarnate. But is his centuries-old head being turned by a teenage hot piece of ass? <laughs> XOXO, gossip girl. Zoe doesn't think he's in Venice though. It doesn't feel right, Stark said. I suppressed a sigh of irritation because it was obvious he'd been psychically eavesdropping on me. I don't think he can help it. I mean, he can't help it, but he can, like, not say things. Also, maybe she should have more um, sympathy for Aphrodite now that she knows what it's like to be psychically eavesdropped on. They work out Zoe has dreamed of San Clement Island, which is in the Fledgling Handbook, but it's also the place where Aphrodite saw Zoe die. The island Zoe saw Kelowna on is Capri. Twitter says he went in front of the High Council with Nefret just a couple of hours ago, so he's there now, Jack said. Who is tweeting this? The priestesses? The staff? Surely there'd be NDAs? Or is there an official spokes vampire for the council who is live tweeting everything? Give me, like, more world building. This vampire's on the internet. It's more interesting to learn about that than hearing the twins snipe at everyone for the 50th time. Like, world build. They decide to go to Italy chapter 29. Oh, don't be so hateful, Aphrodite, Stevie Ray said. You know all the fledglings get passports as soon as they're marked. It's part of the whole I'm an emancipated teen thing. Convenient. To stop myself from yelling, you're not going, you'll just get killed for sure at Heath and embarrassing the bejesus out of him. Foreshadowing. That'll be the easy part. We'll simply take the House of Knights jet, Lenobia said. Tories. You won't go with us? My stomach dropped. Lenobia was wise and so well thought of in the vamp community that even Shekinah had expected her. We needed her to go with us. I needed her to go with us. She can't, Jack said. We looked at him in surprise. She has to stay here with Dragon and be sure the school doesn't completely go over to the dark side, because whatever it is Kelowna can do, he's still doing it even though he's not here. As if the high priestesses are going to listen to Zoe over an Nefaret and a demigod. I mean, they still might, because Zoe is a Mary Sue with main character syndrome, but still, point stands. But she saw me with you. If I can't protect you, who can? I can, Darius said. Air can too, Damien said. Fire can kick some butt, Shawnee said. I got water, and I'm sure as hell not letting Zoe drown, Erin said indignantly. Earth will always protect Zoe, Stevie Ray said, though her expressive eyes seemed sad. I'm annoying the human, but I'm still mean. If someone gets by Darius, you and the herd of nerd, the nerd of herd, they'll have to go through me too, said Aphrodite. Add one more annoying to that human fledgling and vamp soup, he said. See, I told Stark as I blinked hard to keep the tears that filled my eyes from overflowing. What in the Disney Channel is this crap? I think we were all a little stunned and hadn't quite grasped the fact that we were actually going to Italy to speak before the Vampire High Castle. Or at least I was going to speak. Ah, hell. I was going to have to speak in front of the ha Vampire High Castle. Or maybe I'd get up there in front of all those old powerful vamps and have raging diarrhoea and poop myself. Yep, that would certainly make an impression on the council. Unique would just be one of the words they'd call me. Stop it. They leave to get ready. I can't believe we're supposed to take one book bag of clothes. Where are all my shoes going to go? Jack asked. I think we're only supposed to take one pair of shoes, Heath said helpfully. Jack was still gasping in horror as he and Damien left. <laughs> Stark is in a weird mood, as always, but this time it's because he's worried about Aphrodite's vision. He surprises Zoe by telling Heath to sleep next to Zoe so he can do some work. Don't let Stark hurt your feelings, Zoe. Heath said. He's pissed at himself, not you. Heath, I appreciate you wanting to make me feel better, but it's just too weird to have you be on Stark's side. She definitely wants the boys to be fighting over her because she loves being in the centre of drama. Stevie Ray tells Zoe that she's not going to Italy so she can look after her fledglings. Oh no, Stevie Ray, you're not still thinking about those bad fledglings. I'm the high priestess, she said quietly, pleading with her eyes for me to understand. They're my responsibility. While you're gone, before you have to go down there and do something awful to them, I can try once more to reach them, to get them to turn back to their humanity. Zoe doesn't understand the concept of being responsible because even though she's the most gifted fledgling ever, all she thinks about is boy drama. 
maybe they were meant to die and that's why they can't get their humanity back i said softly that logic isn't really logicking but okay zoe tells heath he can't come to italy because he has school but they compromise on him telling his parents he's allowed to go if they say yes do i have to tell them about Colonna and stuff i don't think it's smart for the general public to know there's a fallen immortal and a crazy ex-high priestess trying to take over the world so no you don't have to tell them that part i don't know mate might be nice to give the humans a heads up kind of involves them too they go to sleep zoe dreams she's back on the castle chapter 30 zoe Colonna is crying because Zoe chucks herself off the mountain previously. What a big baby. I'm not inside your head. You have never called me into your dreams. I draw your essence to me. The invasion was mine, not through any invitation of yours. That's not what you said before. I lied to you before. I'm speaking the truth to you now. As if she can believe that after you admit that. Again, he called me Zoe. He hasn't once called me Aya as he liked to do and he wasn't touching me at all. Wow, forget about all the assaults he did then. What a good guy. I was wrong. She decides to trust him and he shows her his life. His wings used to be white when he was Nyx's warrior. I do nothing, Kelowna. You have a choice in this. I give even my warriors free will, though I don't require them to use it wisely. I was shocked by how cold Nyx sounded. For a second, she actually reminded me of how Aphrodite used to be. I cannot help myself. I was created to feel, feel this. It is not free will. It is preordination. I mean, Nyx definitely doesn't give Zoe free will, but okay. Anyway, Cologne is kicked out of Nyx's realm for reasons as of yet unknown. I was jealous. I even hated Erebus. I blinked in shock. Erebus was Nyx's consort, her eternal lover. My love for her made me break my oath. I was so obsessed with her. I couldn't protect her anymore. I failed as her warrior. That's terrible, I said, thinking of Stark. He'd only been sworn to me for days, and already I knew it would be like ripping away a part of his soul if he failed to protect me. How long had Cologne been Nyx's warrior? Centuries? How long was a piece of eternity? Yes. Zoe knowing Stark for a week is the exact same as Colonna and Nyx knowing each other for thousands of years. Zoe feels sorry for him because women being collateral damage to men is something no one cares about in this book. If this really is true, then you have to know you've become the evil you used to fight. He looked away from me, but not before I saw shame in his eyes. Yes, I know. I've chosen a different path. I can't love evil, and that is the truth, I said. His eyes came instantly back to me. And if I choose to reject evil, what then? Demigod changed his behaviour for a 17-year-old girl he just met. Of course, it's a woman's responsibility to change a man. His questions threw me like, totally off guard, so I blurted the first thing that came to my mind. You can't reject evil, not while you're with Neferet. What if I'm only evil with Neferet? What if the truth is that if I were with you, I could choose good? Step back and think I'm more of a vomit! <laughs> and of course, he's only being bad because he's with an evil woman. And if you really think about it, all of this happened because Nyx, a woman, rejected him in the first place. Bloody women. Can't live with them can't live eternally underground without them no this version of you isn't real you're not stark you're a fallen immortal nefret's lover you've assaulted women made people your slaves killed people your sons almost killed my grandma one of them did kill professor anastasia i grabbed onto all the negatives i could and held them at him the fledglings and professors at house of night started to question nicks because of you they're still acting wrong whether it's their choice or not they're filled with fear and hate and jealousy just like you were with nicks he acted like i wasn't standing there shrieking at him he simply said you saved stark can't you save me too? Save yourself, you bloody lazy man. Zoe wakes up because she's had enough. Fair enough. Well then, go back to sleep. This switching up days and nights is finally working for me and I want to stay in practice, Heath said, holding his arms open for me to slide back into. Damn, Heath is screwing up his circadian rhythm just for Zoe. She doesn't deserve him. Chapter 31, Zoe. Zoe doesn't tell Stevie Ray or Heath about her dream because it's okay if she keeps secrets, but not anyone else. Heath rings his parents to ask if he can go to Italy and they say yes. I ground my teeth together. I could not believe he was working his parents so easily. Of course, it was true that even though Nancy and Steve Luck were nice people and pretty good parents, they were absolutely clueless about teenage stuff. Seriously, Heath had been drinking for years and they never noticed, not even when he came home smelling like puke and beer. Alcohol very obviously stinks when you aren't drinking but other people have, so like, if they were good parents, they 100% would notice. How could you not? Z, he's your imprint of human. His blood is super good for you. You're going into a dangerous situation with confronting Colonna and Neferet at the High Council. So you might need some super good for you blood. Well, isn't that nice that humans have a role just as walking blood bags? Zoe tells Stevie Ray part of her dream and Stevie Ray is very understanding because she's projecting her own conflicting feelings about Rafame onto Zoe's situation, most likely in the hopes that when she is caught out about Rafame, Zoe will remember her leniency and thus be lenient with her. So predictable. The cafeteria was busy, but bizarrely too quiet as Aphrodite, Stevie Ray and I joined the twins, Jack and Damien, who were already wolfing down bacon and eggs. I don't know why I included that. It just had a lot of commas. It's correct. It just has a lot of commas. I gulped some eggs and said, I mean the kids. I paused and waved my fork at the rest of the room for emphasis. The ones who are giving us the stank eye and being so insanely horrid are choosing to be that way. Yeah, Colonna started it. 
but they're choosing their own paths. So what? Like, what does this even mean logically? That all of them are bad even without Kelowna being around? Because what would that mean for vampiric society if most fledglings at this school are actually just evil? Eric appears to say hello and good luck for no reason I can see. Stark is still upset over Aphrodite's visions. Get over it. With all my heart, I said honestly, there is no other vampire I would ever want as my warrior. I trust you. Always. Stark looked like about a zillion pounds had been lifted off his back. It's good to hear you say that. I stood and faced him. I would have told you that before, but I thought you already knew. I guess I did. In here. He touched the spot over his heart, but my ears needed to hear it. I stepped into his arms and pressed my face against his neck. I trust you. Always, I repeated. You don't even know him. Chapter 32. They're getting ready to leave, but Lenobia doesn't want Jack to go. I think he should go, I said. He's part of this. Plus, I continued, following my instincts and knowing by the sense of rightness inside me that I was voicing something Nyx wanted everyone to hear. Jack has an affinity. What? I do? I smiled at him. I think you do. Your affinity is for the magic of the modern world. Technology. Damien grinned. It's true. Jack understands anything audio, visual or computer. I just thought he was a tech genius, but really he's a tech genius goddess squared. Oh my god, how cool is that? Jack said. Then you're right, Zoe. Jack should go with you. Nix gifted him for a purpose, and that purpose could very well be great use to you. That is so pulled out of their ass. Being good at computers is not the same as being able to shoot fireballs from your bare hands. She smiled. I've informed the High Council that we consider you our High Priestess. I felt a little jolt of shock. Seriously? Seriously. You are, Zoe. You've earned it. And you're connected to Nyx in a way no other fledgling or vampire has ever been. Keep following the goddess and make us proud. She's 17. Good lord. They board the private jet. Perhaps we should reconnoiter with Afro... Sure is a choice of words, isn't it? I smiled to myself as the twins moved up seats from across Aphrodite, who sneered at them, but launched quickly into an enthusiastic list of the shopping possibilities in Venice. I've said previously it doesn't make much sense that twins didn't get on with Aphrodite beforehand, seeing as they are just a pair of bullies. Zoe goes to sleep. Again. You know you can end your chapters in different ways, right? Chapter 33, Stevie Ray. Stevie Ray is going back to the tunnels to convince the fledglings to join her at the school and Lenobia agrees and they try to arrange plans for the red fledglings. Be sure to give yourself plenty of time. I don't want you stuck there. And the forecast is for lots of Oklahoma sunshine. Travis Mayers even reported it might get above freezing long enough to get rid of some of this ice. Trav is my favourite weatherman. I'm surprised he's not a weather vamp. And don't worry, I'll be back before dawn. So I had to Google this person. They do exist, but like, unless you're from Tulsa and you're reading this, there's just no like frame of reference for it. Lenobia tells Stevie Ray that the Raven Mockers are irredeemably evil, which seems a bit prejudiced considering she'd never even heard of them until a few days ago. Lenobia studied Stevie Ray silently before replying. Then she spoke quietly, but with conviction. Priestess, do not let the compassion you feel for the red fledglings colour your perception of evil. It exists here in our world. It also exists in the other world. It is tangible there, just as it is here. There is a great deal of difference between a broken child and a creature fathered by evil and conceived through assault. That last sentence sure is a series of words put together in some type of order. She texts Nicole to tell them she's come into the tunnels. Just looking for food. Live food. Want to join us? CV Ray knew it would do no good whatsoever to remind Nicole they shouldn't be eating people. No, not even homeless people or bad drivers. How big of you to remember that homeless people are indeed people. Also, these fledglings are legit just going around killing humans and Stevie Ray knows about it but has done nothing about it and she was hiding her, their existence until yesterday from Zoe. And yet somehow Aphrodite is still the bad guy because she apparently hid her visions. Now it's from Rafame's perspective. Nicole straight up tells Rafame that she plans to trap Stevie Ray on the building roof so she fries to death in the sun and they're going to use Rafame as bait whether he wants it or not. Chapter 34. They land in Venice. Zoe slept the whole time and so notices everyone has been crying. He jerked his chin over his shoulder at everyone behind us, including Keith, who was even looking kind of misty-eyed. They just got done watching Milk. It made them all ball like babies. Hey, that's a good movie. And it's super sad too. I have no idea what that is, so thanks for nothing. He's my favourite author, Stark said a little shyly. I'll have to check him out. He doesn't write chick books, Stark said. Douchebag confirmed as though the assault in the last book wasn't already confirmation. Welcome to Venetia, she said. I know at least one of you has special needs, so we've pulled directly into our private hangar. I could hear the twins snickering about Stark being special needs slash special services, but we ignored them. 
Great. They meet Ursi. So it's true that sunlight isn't simply uncomfortable for you. It will literally burn you. I could hear the curiosity in her voice and it didn't sound pushy or, oh my God, you're such a freak. She sounded honestly concerned. Well, she is round about 300 years old. If Lenobia is anything to go by, I wouldn't expect her to act like a teenager. Are we going to have time to shop before the high council meeting? Aphrodite said. Ah, you must be Aphrodite. Yes, merry meet, whatever. So can we shop? Best character. Consorts have long been allowed in the council chamber because of their importance to their vampires. She paused here to smile at Heath, who was totally obviously human. They are not allowed to speak before the high council because humans do not have a say in intimate vampire matters and policies. No, policies and issues. Heath sighed dramatically, smooshed himself next to me and, ignoring Stark, who was sitting on the other side of me, draped his arm possessively around my shoulders. Why would you act like this around adults? It's so annoying and cringe. So does that mean I can attend the almighty council if I have to shut up like the blood donor over there? Aphrodite asked. You they have made an exception for. You may attend and you may speak, but you have to follow all the other rules of the council. Finally, Aphrodite is getting the recognition that she deserves. Normal humans don't get prophetic visions. So I hate how they keep being like, you're just a human now. What human do you know does prophecies apart from like Nostradamus and that was a billion years ago? And let's be real, if Nostradamus is in this, he probably was a vampire. Which means no shopping right now, Aphrodite said. That's what it means, Ursi said. I was impressed by her patience. Lenobia would probably have snapped Aphrodite's head off before then for her smart, alecky attitude. It's called having a personality, Zoe. You should try it sometime. Anyway, they drive a boat to the island and Aphrodite has a psychic connection thing with Stevie Ray and realises she's in trouble. Chapter 35. Stevie Ray. Stevie Ray knew she was going to die. Finally. The red fledglings have trapped her on the roof inside this metal grate thingamabob i won't really pay attention they had been laughing and joking with each other and had obviously just fed their cheeks were still flushed and their eyes glowing red from fresh blood casual murder the two red fledglings had spent a long time being sarcastic and giving jerk-like excuses not to go of her now the vamps don't let us eat junk food and we heart us some junkies and will rogers high school is right down the street on fifth if i want to go to school i'll go there after dark for lunch wow how terrifying imagine being a victim of these idiots like with their little Disney Channel one-liners, like there's a studio audience clapping in the background. I think I'd happily just die rather than face the embarrassment of being around them. They'd laughed at her, called her an old woman. These are bullies. These are high school bullies. Anyway, the fledglings tell her there's a raven mocker on the roof who they drunk from. So Stevie Ray sneaks off to investigate. Rafame, hey, can you hear me? The sound of her voice, his eyes instantly opened. No, he said, struggling to sit up. Get out of here, they're going to trap. And then they knock her out and we are back to the present moment. Rafame is trapped under the grate with her for some reason. I, I don't know why he's not gonna die. So why is he there? She starts to burn. Instead of running from her, he moved close to her as he could, spreading his good wings so that it provided some shade. Then he raised his uninjured arm and took hold of the rusted grate. Rafame is like the most supportive boy in the series besides Darius. They break the grate and Rafame helps Stevie Ray get to safety back into the earth. Chapter 36, Zoe. When Aphrodite started screaming, Zoe knew only one thing to do. Spirit, come to me, she commanded. Why are we in third person for Zoe? And it doesn't even last the whole chapter, bear in mind. Also, Aphrodite can't catch a break. She has the visions that hurt her and traumatise her, an imprint with one of the most annoying people in the series, and she also feels her pain. Anyway, they, like... Why is Aphrodite constantly being a martyr for these idiots? They ring Lenobia so that she can go look for Stevie Ray. I could already hear by the change in Lenobia's voice that she was on the move. Aphrodite, can you tell where Stevie Ray is? It's back in first person, already baffling. We crowded through the chase, silently watching Aphrodite. Ursi turned to me and said in a low voice, there is nothing that can be done for the human if the imprinted vampire is suffering. She will feel Stevie Ray's pain until the crisis is over or until she is dead. Like, what is the point of that? The point here is that this is the only way Zoe would have known something is wrong with Stevie Ray via Aphrodite's imprint and it raises the stakes a little bit because oh, Aphrodite might now die from feeling someone's psychic connection pain. But what is the point in the humans feeling the vampire's pain? Humans can't protect vampires because vampires are superior in every single way. It would make sense if the vampire could feel the human's pain as a warning and go protect them. After all, the humans are like they're blood bags right that makes sense but the inverse of that what's the point also the vampires can survive getting traumatized via an imprint but the humans can die due to just being imprinted and them just feeling pain which seems really unfair i don't know why any human would bother doing this but okay 
Heath gripped her hand and I saw her hold on to him for all she was worth. Everyone was watching them, but I think I was the only one who felt like an outsider. How is she making this about her? That's it. Aphrodite pulled her hand from mine and covered Heath's with it. It feels like I'm sharing my soul and I can't stand it. Yes, you can. Just remember it's a feeling. It's not real. I backed away a few steps. This was going to lead up to her acting as though Heath wasn't just saying this to make Aphrodite feel better. Maybe that does happen. I can't remember. But that's how it seems, right? She's going to turn his words, his comforting words to Aphrodite into some sort of drama about her. Ursi gives Aphrodite a pill, which does nothing. She screams and then she's fine as Stevie Ray gets underground. But she's like this because of a vampire. That is the chance every consort takes. Except Aphrodite had zero choice in the matter and didn't want to be imprinted in the first place. I hate this book. Like, there's no consent. Also, what if a vampire randomly feeds off a human one day and they get imprinted and the human is stuck with... It's just, there's no consent with this kind of thing. But don't worry, because Aphrodite just felt their imprint break as Stevie Ray imprinted with someone else. Guess who? Chapter 37. Stevie Ray and Rafaim are underground in a pocket of earth. Stevie Ray is very wounded and possibly close to death due to her burns. Then if blood will heal you, take mine. I owe you a life. That's why I saved you on the roof. But if you die here, you die without my debt being repaid. So if you need blood, take mine, he repeated. But you don't smell right, she blurted. Rude. Beggars can't be choosers. Drink, he said harshly. Help me rid of myself of this debt. That's what he thinks. Then it touched her tongue. Its taste was like nothing Stevie Ray could have imagined. It wasn't anything remotely like the scent of him. It said it was an incredible surprise, filling her mouth and her soul with its rich complexity, its absolute difference from anything she'd ever experienced. Yeah, bet he filled her mouth. She heard him hiss and the hand that had been on the back of her neck guiding him, guiding her to his arm tightened its grip on her. Stevie Ray moaned. Drinking from the Raven Mocker couldn't be a sexual experience, but it wasn't exactly not a sexual experience either. Guys, is this technically bestiality? They imprint, which I forgot that this had happened. Stevie Ray looked down, her shoulders slumped. You killed Professor Anastasia. She was really nice. Her mate, Dragon, is lost about her. I did what I had to do for my father. And he deserted you, I said. Nope, she said. I disappointed him. You almost died. He is still my father, he said quietly. This whole book is just like parent issues, daddy issues, whatever. This feeling I have for you, I don't know what to call it. Maybe we could call it friendship? Impossible. Incel. Stevie Ray grinned. Well, I was just telling Zoe that stuff we once thought was impossible might not be so black and white. Not black and white, but good and evil. You and I are on two opposing sides in the balance of good versus evil. But do evil people often see themselves as evil though? Don't a lot of evil people, dictators, whatever, usually think that they're doing the right thing? Stevie Ray overhears Lenobia and Eric looking for her, so she hides Rafame and opens a hole in the earth to speak to them. They run off to find something to cover Stevie Ray from the sun, like a tent, which, you know, this whole red fledgling thing is very inconvenient for the red fledglings, considering, like, they could die if they go outside. She tells Rafame to go hide in a ghost tour museum. I was watching a ghost show the other night. It was so funny. <laughs> they had, like, this, this new camera which could read infrared, right? And then, like they put these little stick fig or it worked out there were these just white stickers with the infrared and these like not stickers white stick men on the ca and but like they were moving so they were being like oh my god look there's a ghost over there and this guy he's at this table and it was some sort of like old miners pub in america where miners used to go and drink after work right and this guy's sitting at this table with this whiskey and then they're like look there's one right next to him oh my god look and he takes a shot and they're like oh my god look the, the ghost was reaching for it or whatever it just looks like the stick man is twerking it's the weirdest thing and then this guy was like i've got the strangest feeling i really want to have a shot i feel like i think it's the ghosts and the spirits telling me to have a shot of alcohol and he just starts drinking and it's like what am i watching anyway Spirits of the dead. Stevie Ray raised her brows. You're not scared of them, are you? No, I understand them too well. I existed as a spirit for centuries. He's too old for a dude. Stay safe, he said. If you don't, I... I believe I would perhaps feel your loss. He hesitated over the words, like he didn't quite know how to say them. Wow, romantic king. Chapter 38. Zoe rings Stevie Ray, who lies and says it all was just a big accident and she accidentally like went outside or whatever. That's where Lenobia found you? Yeah, Lenobia and Eric. He was real nice, by the way. Not that you should be with him again, but I thought you'd like to know. Why are we praising a man for the bare minimum? Of course he should be nice. You almost died. 
Aphrodite said you were trapped. She was sure of it. Z, I tripped and hit my head. I'm sure Aphrodite picked up on my panic. I mean, when I woke up, I was burning. Plus, I'd fallen over some metal trash on the roof and I was all tangled up in it. I'm telling you, it scared the bejesus out of me. She must have felt that. So no one grabbed you? You went occasion anywhere? No, Z, she laughed. That's just crazy. But it would make a better story than me tripping up over my own feet. Stevie Ray, gaslighting, gatekeeping and girl bossing Zoe. I mean, it is probably wise to keep Zoe away from Rafaim or he will end up joining her harem too. Okay, that's another weird part. How did that happen? Your imprint didn't even break when Darius drank from her and you know they have that thing between them. My guess is because the cast duo hate Aphrodite, so her wants and needs are less important than Stevie Ray's. Zoe doesn't even ask who Stevie Ray imprinted with. Zoe hangs up to face the High Council. Also, that could fall apart so instantly considering Eric and Lenobia found her, but they found her alone. So where would she have the time to suddenly imprint with someone else in that exact moment? That falls apart too easily. It's... This high council is at some cathedral, all like toried up, and Zoe notices a stained glass window with the image of Erebus on it, who looks very similar to Kelowna. So she worries that she won't be believed. Which, you know, where is Erebus anyway? Why doesn't he come to Earth for five minutes just to say that identity theft is not a joke, Kelowna? Yeah, yeah, I remember I said something about Ursi was annoying me. Okay, she was Lenobia's friend, so I wanted to like her. But since Aphrodite's freak out, she'd stepped in and been acting like she was seriously the boss of me and all my friends. She's like a centuries old vampire, you little brat. I know it was ridiculous and immature, but I felt a terrible longing for my grandma. I wished with everything inside me that I was curled up at her cottage back at her Oklahoma lavender farm, eating popcorn that was too buttery, watching a marathon of Rogers and Hammerstein musicals. And the worst thing I had to worry about was how much I totally didn't get geometry. <laughs> okay, we get it. You're relatable to teenagers. The High Council arrives and they are completely perfectly beautiful, of course, which... I think that's how the vampire world works, right? The more beautiful you are, the more important you must be. After all, Elliot was Uggers, right? He was well butters, so he dies. Jack is only just cute. He's not super, super hot or anything. So he ends up, spoiler alert, dying. Zoe is so beautiful, a demigod wants her. And so she's like the most special fledgling ever. You get my point. Nefre and Klonoa, it's not Klonoa, it's Klona, the little cat man, turn up. He looked like a god who had decided to walk the earth. No way. Really? I think that's because he kind of is. Anyway, Zoe starts obsessing over Kelowna as soon as she sees him. Zoe prays to Nyx that Kelowna will tell the truth to the council. At the side of the goddess incarnate, Nefret interrupted, standing beside Kelowna. Surely it's a bit blasphemous for Neferet to be talking like this in front of the council. They've known her for decades, maybe even like a hundred years or so, right? So how are they not rolling their eyes at her for pretending she's Nyx now? They also keep calling her Neferet instead of Nyx incarnate, but I don't know why they're even giving her the time of day because she's acting so obviously unhinged and they've all known her for a long time. They would like notice, they would know what's going on. They'd know that she's not actually Nyx incarnate. It's just so unbelievable. I fell, Kelowna looked from the council member to me and spoke the rest of his response as if he and I were alone in the room. I chose to leave because I no longer believed I served my goddess well. At first, it felt like I had made a terrible mistake. And then I rose from the earth to find a new realm and a new mistress. Lately, I have begun to believe I could indeed serve my goddess again, only this time through her representative on earth. Blanchia's gracefully arched brows rose as she followed his gaze, which rested on me. Her eyes widened only slightly. Zoe Redbird, the council recognises you. So now, Zoe is Nick's representative on earth. Might as well just call her Nyx incarnate and be done with it. Chapter 39. Our sister Lenobia notified us that in Neferet's absence from your house of night, you have been named High Priestess, therefore you represent their will. It is entirely inappropriate for a fledgling to be named High Priestess, Neferet said. She's not wrong though, is she? Neferet's not wrong. I am still High Priestess of Tulsa's house of night. Not if your house's council has deposed you, said Duanshia. The appearance of Erebus and the death of Shekinna has shaken Tulsa's House of Night greatly, especially following so soon after the terrible and tragic murders of two of our professors by local humans. It saddens me, but the council members of my house are not thinking clearly. Neferet is the true gaslight gatekeep girl boss, and I kind of love it because it pisses Zoe off. Another council member spoke up. Her dark eyes flashed and her voice was sharp, almost sarcastic. I thought she must be Thanatos, the vampire who'd taken on the Greek name for death. Vampiric society is quite the conflation, isn't it? Because they've got the Greeks, pagans, Native Americans, Mary from Christianity. It's a bit greedy. Like, what next? 
all of the gods from ancient Egypt. You can't just, you can't do this. This is not allowed. This is illegal, I've decided. This is blasphemous. My mouth was so dry I had to swallow twice before I could speak. And then when the words finally came, what I said took me by surprise as if my heart said them without asking my mind's permission. She really is Nyx incarnate. Hmm. She tells the council who Kelowna really is. My grandmother's people are Cherokee and they have an old legend about him. They called him Kelowna. He lived with the Cherokee after he fell from Nix's realm. I don't think he was himself then. Wait, if they call him Kelowna, what's his actual name? Because surely like Nix won't call him Kelowna. What's his real name? Wait, he lived with the Cherokee after he fell from Nix's realm. I don't think he was himself then. He did terrible things to the women of the tribe. He fathered monsters. She's kind of defending him here with the whole, oh, he wasn't in his right mind. Therefore, it's okay that he assaulted all those women and made them give birth to his feathery children. Anyway, Zoe says Neferet has turned away from Nyx and there's an outcry against this as if it isn't really obvious like she is walking around calling herself Nyx incarnate why are people mad at zoe for this when nephra is the one obviously being blasphemous it doesn't make it just doesn't make sense like imagine at the vatican some council went on and some bloke was like i am jesus incarnate i am the second coming of christ blah 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 it was just like but it was a bloke that like maybe he'd been a priest for a few decades and then he's just decided no actually he's jesus he wouldn't be t like that, that wouldn't be taken seriously would it would it hmm maybe if they were mormons i could see okay that's more of a possibility considering how the book of mormon was founded you remember martin harris the rich man who wrote down what joseph smith read out of the hat yeah. See, after he was done, he took some of the pages of what would become the Book of Mormon home. And so Joseph Smith put his head into a hat and, and read to me what the golden plate said. I wrote it all down and we're going to publish it into a book. Martin, how do you know he isn't just making stuff up and pretending he's translating off golden plates? I could see, you know, just, just some bloke with blonde hair being like, hey guys, I'm actually God. And then being like, oh wow, cool, great. Good one, nice. Good for you, buddy. <laughs> I can see that. I can see it working with Mormons, but like with this vampiric society who's meant to be like part science, part mythology, part every other religion ever. They're all meant to be like geniuses, whatever. Also, it's the way that Nyx could simply come down for a minute and say to the High Council, Nephra is acting whack, do with this info what you will. The same way that she's been warning Zoe for months, she appeared in person to Zoe and Aphrodite to talk about all of this. She could do it with any member of the High Council, chooses not to. Nephret ignored me and appealed to the council. She's infatuated with Erebus. Why must I be subjected to this jealous child slander? She's so dramatic though. I love her. Kelowna says, My experiences are why I feel so strongly about bringing back the old ways where once vampires and their warriors strode the earth, proud and strong, instead of hiding in clusters of schools and only letting our young outside the gates if they have their marks covered, as if the goddess's crescent is something of which they should be ashamed. Vampires are Nyx's children. What are humans then? If vampires are Nyx's children, did Nyx create the humans or is there like a human god for that? World build. And the goddess never meant for you to cower in darkness. Let us all step into the light. Right. What he's saying here makes no sense with this world build that we have, considering every famous person is a vampire, including Garth Brooks. So hiding how, you feathery nonce. Nefret is all, oh, and I bought the island of Capri, so then she storms off. I love her. I think she's my favourite character now. Everyone spoke at once, some clearly wanting to call Nefret and Kelowna back, some indignant that they'd left. No one, not one vampire, spoke against them. And whenever his name was spoken, they called him Erebus. They believe him, Stark said. Ridiculous that they believed him in the first place. This is meant to be like the best and brightest of the vampiric society. But also this could all be solved by Nyx getting off her ass, coming down from paradise and saying hello to the council. Same way she did to Zoe and Aphrodite a few months uh, books ago. It's pathetic. Everyone disperses and questions Zoe. So she tells them about the vision Kelowna saw, uh, showed her. Not anymore, he isn't. I tried to keep my voice calm, but I just wanted to yell back at Stark. He hadn't seen the vision. How could he judge whether it was true or not? Well, people wouldn't keep dismissing you like this if you just told people stuff in the first place instead of leaving it for them to find out when it's too late. No, it hasn't. I haven't jumped on Team Kelowna. All I'm doing is trying to see the truth here. What if the truth is that he used to be on the right side? Maybe he could find the right side again, I said. He's the one who's choosing to be with Neferay and is choosing to sleep with her. Therefore, 
making evil choices of his own free will. But why does Zoe ride so hard for him and yet not give the same grace to Neferet? Neferet could change and find the right side again, but would she be forgiven if she did decide to do that right now? No, because she's not a bloke. Even though the bloke in question is a mass assaulter and serial killer, but okay. It's not the same thing. I wasn't evil for centuries. I No, it's Stark, it's not Zoe. I didn't turn an entire tribe of people into my slaves and assault their women, Stark said. You were going to assault Becca if Darius and I hadn't stopped you. The words came blurting out of my mouth before my good sense could stop them. Oh dear. Stark walks off because he can't handle the truth. Heath took my hand. Zoe, his favourite son, killed Anastasia and almost killed those other kids who stood up to him. I know, I sobbed. But what if he only let them do that because Neferet wanted it? <laughs> See, men aren't evil. It's the women who are the problem. Okay, but I need a minute. I wiped my face on my sleeve. Jack, who'd been watching everything with big worried eyes, opened his man purse and handed me a little travel Kleenex package. They're going to be so screwed without their live-in assistant Jack, aren't they? Heath says, yeah, I figured, but I wanted to tell you something. He took me by both my shoulders and made me meet his gaze. You have to fight this thing you feel for, for Kelowna. And I'm not saying that because I'm jealous or whatever. I've loved you since we were kids. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to turn away from you no matter what you say or do. But Kelowna isn't like Stevie Ray or Stark. He's immortal. He's from another whole kind of world. And so I get I want to rule the world vibes from him. You're the only one who can stop him. So he has to have you on his side. He gets into your dreams. He connects in. He gets into your mind. And there's a part of him that's even connected to your soul. I understand that because I'm connected to your soul to. How is this idiot way more sensible than Zoe? Heath and Zoe have a romantic moment and he goes to find Stark and he is so going to die. Around the palace to my right was the ancient cathedral turned high council chamber. All this beauty, all this power and majesty around me and I'd been too self-absorbed to see any of it. Finally some self-awareness only took six books. I prayed. Nix I need you. I think I'm lost. Please help me. Please show me something that will make things clearer to me. I don't want to mess up. Again. Heath is so dead. Like, recognise what she's asking for here. He's going to be sacrificed just so Zoe stops getting horny for Kelowna. Pathetic. Chapter 40. Heath. Told you. Heath wondered if Zoe knew she was breaking his heart. She would have to stop thinking about herself for more than five minutes at a time, mate. So here he was, going to find a guy who had a piece of her heart because that was what was best for Zoe. Cuck. Heath overhears Nefre and Kelowna yapping. Somehow a vampire and an immortal don't notice Heath eavesdropping. Mortals, you say that as if you are so far removed from us. I'm immortal, which makes me different, even from you. Though your sea sigilly powers are transforming you into something that is close to a mortal. Yes, but Zoe isn't anything close to a mortal. I still believe we should kill her. Wow, what a smart conversation to be loudly having right outside of the High Council. You are a bloodthirsty creature, Kelowna laughed. What would you do? Cut off her head and impale her as you did the other two who got in your way? Geniuses, the pair of them. Heath's heart was pounding so loud he was sure they'd be able to hear him. Neferet had killed Zoe's two professors and Kelowna knew about it and thought it was funny. No way would Zoe believe there was any good in him after she heard about this. Nah, man, she's definitely just going to blame it all on Ned. But Neferet surprised him by pulling away from Kelowna. No, you can't make love to Zoe in her dreams and then again with your eyes in front of everyone and expect me to open my body to you. I won't be yours tonight. She is too much between us. Neferet needs to stop giving Zoe her sloppy seconds. First Blake, now Kelowna. What next? The evil primordial white ball that is actually the real nemesis of the series? Neferet flounces off and Kelowna notices Heath and Heath tries to use his imprint to warn Zoe. Stark. Stark is trying to find Aphrodite. Thanks, I think. Stark blew out a long breath. Even though Zoe made him crazy, he knew he should never walk away from her again. He was her warrior. His place, no matter how tough it got, was by her side. It must be difficult to make a lifelong commitment to someone you barely know. Thanks again. Stark started in the direction the warrior had sent him, walking quickly. He had an itchy feeling on the back of his neck. He hated it when he got that feeling. It meant something was going wrong, and that meant it was a stupid time for him to get pissed at Zoe. This is Nyx doing this, I'm so sure. She needs to stop vague booking and just tell the council directly. Nyx is literally like like a middle-aged mum on Facebook being like, oh my God, I've had enough of everyone. And then Zoe and the high council are like, oh, are you okay, hun? DM me. And then she's like, nah, it's okay, hun, don't worry. That's Nyx. Stark climbed the stairs three at a time. The first door to his left was partially open and he could see into the rich looking room that had a couple of those couches that were too little and a bunch of uncomfortable chairs, all done up in golds and creams. Like that wouldn't get dirty? Why does Stark's narrative just sound like Zoe? Stark feels Zoe's emotions and knows she's in danger and all the other idiots notice and they run after him. 
All of them, including Zoe, get to Heath and Kelowna, but Kelowna kills Heath instantly. Zoe throws spirit at Kelowna, so Kelowna flies off. But Stark didn't give a shit about Kelowna. Or even Heath. That's nice. It was Zoe he ran to. She lay crumpled on the ground not far from Heath's body. She was face down and Stark knew the terrible truth before he reached her. Still, he dropped to his knees and rolled her over gently. Her eyes were open and staring but vacant. Except for the sapphire outline of a normal fledgling's mark, all of her tattoos were gone. She's alive but gone because her soul is shattered. And I'm very sure in the next book she's low-key blamed by Nyx or like herself for losing her cool and throwing everything she could at Kelowna as if she was meant to just calmly do nothing or react calmly to Kelowna murdering Heath, her like oldest friend and boyfriend. Again, women being blamed for the action of men. I think that is the title of this video. I need to shorten it somehow. The end. Wait, no, epilogue. Zoe is in a meadow. The meadow was totally beautiful. It reminded me of something. Really? Nope, not thinking. I smiled as my words become visible, creating sparkly purple patterns in the air. So being in heaven is just being on psychedelics, really. She sees Heath fishing and he's just totally at ease, even though he's just died. He died like 10 seconds ago, but he's just, he's fine with being dead. And he's like, Zoe, you're not meant to be here. This is the other world. The end. That is the end of that. Women being blamed for the actions of men. The novel that's all for today's video thank you guys so much for watching i hope you enjoyed it remember to like comment subscribe i make new videos whenever i feel like it follow me on instagram might just follow you back and check out my third channel and my other channel my pod channel where there's a whole bunch of uploads up there i was trying to do a podmas on both kind of failed on that but there's loads of content so go check them out and see you on oh and check out my merch store ayclothing.email.com get yourself some christmas merch and i'll see you guys in the next video bye